Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome everybody to our first instructional committee meeting of the new year. And welcome to Ms. Autumn Alli Allenson to her first official, well actually I suppose last night was your first official <laughs> board meeting, but welcome. Um, our first order of business tonight is to accept um, instructional committee mi meeting minutes from November 4th and November 12th. Is there any discussion on those? I, I had a quick um, question that November 12th meeting, there was only four of us in attendance, according to the minutes. Can we accept, is that, yep. we can accept it? Yeah, because the minutes just state what happened at the meeting. Right. We actually weren't able to do much we didn't do, uh, business we didn't at that meeting right. because okay. of the lack of quorum, okay. but yeah. Okay, just wanna make sure. Um, so I'd like to con take consensus on both of those at the same time. If we're good with that, we'll start with Mr. Votto. Yeah. Yes. 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 And yes. Um, thank you all. Our next order of business, um, we're going to start with curriculum coordinators. Um, and if you'll note on the agenda, uh, there's quite a few units that we're going to look at tonight. So, um, and they are grouped by curriculum. So we'll start with um, grade four and grade five music curriculum units. So, Mrs. Bucher, you want to come up? And um, just for the record, if you guys can introduce yourselves when you come on up. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Angela Bucher. I'm the Pre-K-5 Humanities Coordinator. Um, so you have the Grade 4 and 5 music units. So the music department's been working on updating these units for a few years now. Um, the two units that before you were written by the four <coughs> elementary music teachers in the spring with Mr. Franchese, and then we work together as a team this fall to really read through them and, and refine and make any adjustments on them. And with the approval of these two grades, we will then have um, K-5 completely updated and aligned to the national music standards. So the fourth grade units um, really focus on notation and rhythm and the um, getting students to be able to perform in a round of two, different, um, of two different parts. And the fifth grade units continue to build on the skills that are in fourth grade and the years before that. And the fifth grade units culminate with students being able to write, excuse me, to compose four measures um, of music and to not just read it as they're expected to in fourth grade, but actually be able to perform it. Um, so I'm not sure if you have any more specific questions about the units. Questions, Mrs. Purcell. I just had one. Um, when I looked at this, I didn't see, like when I go online, it says unit scoring criteria, and I go click on it, and we don't, we are not given permission for that? Right, we don't generally do that. So there's no way for us to check the, how they're being graded? The scoring criteria itself isn't usually a part of, it's linked in for teachers. I can, I can print it out, but we don't put it on the okay. parent site or otherwise, no. Okay. And we have it for any unit of study. All right, that was my question, thanks. Ms. Levesque? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, when looking at the grade five, uh, unit two, <coughs> and I, the curriculum was very well written, I think it's pretty mm -hmm. clear, and I really like, um, when you wrote this, I looked at page eight of that unit, um, unit two, and it was very nicely done. Have students kindly provide constructive feedback to one another. I think that's, it's good to have feedback from one another, but I like the way in which it was worded kindly, um, not constructively, not right. in a not so good way. <laughs> so I thought that was, well done. Thank you for your feedback. Any other questions or comments? Let's take consensus on grades four and five music, starting with Mr. Votto. Yes. 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 Thank you, Mrs. Bukeri. Thank you. Okay, so C, D, E, F. Kim Moore? Hi, Kim. Hi. Start with our new high school course, Spanish 3, CCP1. Hi everyone, happy new year. I'm Kim Moore, I am the global awareness coordinator for the district which encompasses world language, EL bilingual, and high school capstone. It's very nice to meet you. Um, I am here tonight to bring forward a course addition to the world language program of studies. We currently um, only offer our world language courses, our levels one and two are only offered at the academic level which we're moving away from calling it the academic level and we're calling it CCP1. So currently our, our levels one and two languages are only offered at CCP1 and all of our languages beyond that are only offered at the honors level. 
Um, and we've been dealing as a district, Mrs. DiVirgilio is here, she's a long time Lyman Hall Spanish teacher, and so she knows better than I that for a long time we've been faced with the conundrum of we don't have a third year of language for our students that is not an honors level course. And colleges and universities, some go so far as to say that this is a requirement, but the vast majority say, we urge you or we expect, and they kind of cloak it in this clandestine language that really is, you need to be, you need to be getting that third year. Um, and we currently don't have a program of studies that, that allows that third year to be accessible to, to all of our students. Um, so what we've been, we've grappled in the past as a department and a management team with possibly removing the honors notation from all of our level three languages. But you know, as we've thought about that over the years, that feels like a disservice to the course and to the curriculum. Um, the content, the pace of that course is really deserving of an honors assignation. So what we're looking to do is add in an academic level of Spanish three to our program of studies. Um, ideally, this would be something that we would do for all of our languages so that we wouldn't just have this offering for students who only study Spanish to get this third year, not at the honors level. But the unfortunate reality is that um, we don't have enough numbers and sections that run of our other four languages to be able to do this. We have, on average, 10 sections a year of Spanish three that run in the district. So we would be able to kind of allow the students some flexibility in choosing which le at which level they would like to study the language, whereas our other four languages only have one section um, at each school of, of level three. Uh, so we've had a great deal of teacher input from all of the Spanish teachers at both high schools that teach and have taught this course, that teach the courses that come before it and come after it, to um, really kind of think about meeting the needs of our students in this area. We've also sought student input. Um, the data that I put in here back in November included our Spanish two students from last year. So at this time last year, we pulled the 109 Spanish two students that we had. Um, 29 of them did not want to continue on because the only option was honors. And from those 29, 18 did end up continuing on, but 11 did not with that being the sole reason why. And then we're looking at our current, and the, this is not a unique thing. This is kind of a tale as old as time. We see a massive drop off with our students going into this third year of language because we don't have an option. If you want to pursue it, either because you're intrinsically motivated or for college, career, university readiness, we don't have an offering that, that is not at the honors level. Um, and what is not included in is the most recent data that I got from this year's cohort of Spanish II students. This year of 109, there are 40, 40 that don't want to continue. And of that, 31 of them state that it's because there's only an honors offering. So the other students are either ending their study of the language regardless, graduating, or switching to take another language. So that's a large percentage of the population who yearns to, to get this credit, and, and our current program of studies is doing a disservice to these students. Um, so we're looking to put forward an addition of an academic CCP1 offering of Spanish 3 at our high schools. Questions? Ms. Levesque? It, what does the CCP1 denote? It's college and career uh, preparation. So um, for quite some time, we've always used general, we, we had the basic level general right, academic right. honors AP. Right. Um, I think around the time I came into the office, most of the basic level classes had been stopped. Discontinued. Right. Correct. Um, as part of looking at just how we label courses um, and how we enroll courses and how courses are deemed NCAA eligible, we had to look at how we were um, listing them in the course catalog, et, et cetera. And so we chose through a lot of conversation at the, um, uh, at the different levels to just rename the courses. The curriculum isn't any different. How we enroll isn't any different. Right. But instead of calling them a G-level class or an right. academic level class, uh, they are college and career prep, level one and level two, um, which is pretty typical uh, when you look at high schools um, all along the state. That makes sense. I just, when I looked at yeah. it, I said, what secret code is this? Right, so it know? did change last year um, in the program of studies, mm -hmm. uh, the curriculum planning guide. Mm -hmm. um, we kept general level, academic level, but put 
CCP1 and CCP2 next to it to get okay. people used to the change. All right. In this year's program of studies, uh, which is going to the printer this week, you'll see the CCP1 and 2 first <coughs> with the general level or academic level side. in parentheses. Okay. And then next year, the parentheses will go away. Okay. Just as a means of transitioning both right. of our, uh, all of our students, all of our families, and all of our teaching staff. Yeah. No, I think it's helpful to have that explained so that folks understand. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Votto. The honors course won't have, the academic one won't happen until the next school year. Correct. Um, and personally, I like, to, I like to see that those words kept in because I don't think a lot of parents will understand the C, hmm. what is it? CCP C C one. Right. Uh, one. Um, they're used to academic honors. I, that's why I think that's an advantage. Thank you. With that. Yeah. Ms. Raggio? Um, I agree. I think that it, parents really are used to that level. I mean, the basic has gone, so we, we really don't need to address that. Is this going to be weighted <coughs> for GPA the same as academic classes? And Correct. The, is there any difference between the CCP 1 and 2 for weighting? Yes, just like there's a difference with general and academic. So nothing is changing other than the name. So the and 1 is a general and the 2 is an academic? Reversed. Okay, see, I'm already confused. Um, it's, it's all well dis uh, described in the course planning guide. It was that way last year as well, mm -hmm. as parents come in and students uh, have their assemblies in regards to course selection, which will be happening in the next few weeks. Um, it'll be rediscussed and re-explained, and you know, if it needs to stay on further, that's fine too, it's not a mm -hmm. big deal at all. But nothing other than a name change occurred. Waiting is the same, curriculum is the same, selection is the same, placement is the same. I do support the extra level. That was a conversation that happened in our household. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to go on? I don't want to because it's honors and I mm -hmm. don't. I'm, it's not one of my favorite areas. So I don't want to take it for honors. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think that it will give students, especially now that we award credit and we have um, the credit opportunity for students in the middle school. Yes. That means that they're pretty much out of options after freshman year unless they were able to handle an honors level course. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that you're going to have full courses. So thank you. Yeah. I, and, and some students um, wrote in the comments on the Google form things just like that. I, I don't want an honors course in my schedule. I don't want another one. I need extra support. I'm not ready for the pace of honors. I already put in so much work at home for Spanish. I'm worried that an honors level course makes me feel like I wouldn't be able to keep up. Mm -hmm. And these are things that we've been hearing for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so coupled with what colleges and universities expect but don't often come out right and say that they, they expect, um, and our curriculum planning guide and our offerings it feels, it feels like a mismatch at the moment, and it has for a long time, so mm -hmm. we're hoping to, at least for the language that the majority of our students study, where we actually have the numbers to do what we know is right for the students that we're able to, to do it. And I think it became unbalanced when we started to do that, it, although gr great opportunity, when we started to offer the credit in middle school, that eliminated an opportunity for an extra year of academic if you wanted to keep going in the same language, in yes. The same language. Yep. So this is kind of catching us up now that it's been in place for a while. That's Thank a good you. way to think about it. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I do ha have a couple questions. One, is the curriculum already written for this CCP1 course? So the curriculum is the same as the curriculum for the course that's <coughs> running. It's just, it will be a different pace. There will be um, different expectations on what's done in class versus outside of the class. The, the amount of scaffolding. Okay. Um, um, so rising ninth graders who may have, can they earn two credits in middle school? Can no. they start in Spanish three? They can start, they can in, Spanish start in Spanish three, but they only come in with one credit. They come, right, but they can, so they can start in Spanish three CCP one? Yep. Okay, that's yep. an option for them. And the other uh, thing, Mrs. Latour, you had mentioned NCAA uh, course requirements. I'm not sure everybody's familiar with what that means. Can you just, Oh because boy. that is, that is. <laughs> Where's that, Tony? That's, uh, I know. I know, right? Um, so the so NCAA for eligibility for Division I um, and II uh, require, um, they have certain eligibility requirements. And so high schools, uh, it's important that high schools program of studies or course 
planning guides, curriculum planning guides, um, as you are aligning coursework that you meet those standards so students know, student athletes in particular, um, know what courses are eligible um, and, rem and as they select them and take them, they keep their eligibility uh, moving forward if they choose to do athletics in, in college. So the Clearinghouse, uh, it's a website that you go to, you have to upload your curriculum planning guide. They look at your course descriptions, they look at your different levels and they determine whether or not your course is considered um, eligible by their standards. And um, you know, we've just gone through that process to one, um, clean up our part of the clearinghouse to have one district since both schools offer primarily the same courses, it's the same curriculum, et cetera. Um, we have done as a district a, a new upload and in that process they have our new book that you all saw last year. Um, and as we approve new courses, they get uploaded as soon as the board approves them so that parents and students as they go through the course selection process know exactly which courses are eligible and which are not to keep their, their athletic eligibility intact if they have future plans. I, I think also a title that doesn't include college prep throws right. a red flag up to the mm -hmm. NCAA Correct. eligibility center. So that would be a big reason why we would need to change from academic to a college prep named Correct. course. Um, I, I think they want to see college prep in the name of courses. So like a general level course is probably not accepted as or approved by the NCAA eligibility center. So any student athlete who wants to play division one or division two has to pass 17 courses set forth by the NCAA and well, approved by the NCAA within our district. Within every it, district, there's 17 courses that they have to take <coughs> approved. Right, and it comes, down to, it comes down to a lot of things. Title is very important. Yes. Um, and description is also very important um, so that the clearinghouse um, can tell that it is, regardless of the level or the name, that it's all grade <laughs> level standard um, the curriculum is, is the same for all students. It's not modified so Are dramatically. Are you talking about a transcript right now? Yes. No. Well, yes and no. So. Yeah, the transcript I can understand. Yes. The program. Where I said it, but, in the book, it's but they look at the book to. But they look at the book the to determine whether it's eligible or not. <laughs> right. Well, then turn the piece of paper. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I really think there could be some junior. Oh, yeah. You know, last year was the first year that there was the change, and, and as I said, we listed both names so that it was very clear, you know, and the principals have done a great job as they're explaining it to kids during the course selection okay. process. This year, both names are there, and, and you know, as stated earlier, if we need to keep them for a while longer just to get everybody firmly rooted in, in the new name, it is a name change only. It is not, you know, content or waiting or anything else at this time. Any other questions? So let's take consensus on CCP1 Spanish 3, starting with Mr. Votto. Yes. 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 Thank you. OK, so tell us about going th on the trip to Belize. Do you need any chaperones? OK. <laughs> I'm on the short list if she's <laughs> opening it. Um, Nicole and Decker. <laughs> Um, we're, we're fortunate enough tonight, we have Maggie here with us, I'm not going to get your title right, but she represents EF Education First, which is the tour company that we are hoping to run these next three upcoming agenda items under. Um, Nicole Decker Lawler was here back in September to share this trip to Belize. The board had some concerns about um, some of the activities that were in the original itinerary. Um, so Nikki did a tremendous job doing her homework with EF. We met with Kurt Treiber, the risk assessor for the town, to go through everything that was in the original Plan A. Okay. She had a very thorough Plan B that was also ready to go if any or all of the activities um, were nixed by Kurt. And um, I'll let Nikki, Nikki share more from here. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, so I wanted to let you know the three activities that you thought were risky, which is very, um, I greatly appreciate your um, out, uh, your 
input for that, and therefore I really appreciated learning about the actual trip a little bit more myself. So what I did when I went back, I went and not only talked with Maggie, but I also spoke with uh, TEM, which is the managers that actually plan these with EF, and I also spoke with another teacher who actually went on this trip with our students this past summer. So the three activities that you <coughs> found were risky were that of the zip lining, the snorkeling, and the cave tubing. And so what I did is I spoke with these individuals and not only learned about all the PPE, all the safety that is, goes along with it, all of the different guides that are associated with it, and I even got some video and some um, photography of each of those activities being done. So I, was, I shared that with Kurt, and he has stated that he believes that the original plan is going to be safe, and he approved it. So I came here to tell you that. Um, and you all seem very interested in the original with the other activities, such as um, we know that there's the um, hot sauce factory, we know about the other um, agricultural components, and now we just have these other add-ons as well. Thank you. Any questions? Sure. I just want to thank you for yeah. going that extra mile because we did have concerns. We want mm -hmm. the students <coughs> to be safe and the chaperones mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the trip, so I appreciate you going that extra mile and looking thank into you. that. I learned a lot from it, so if I choose to do other trips in the future, I know what to look for and how I can make it just easier uh, as an overall thing for not only myself, but you all as well. So thank you very much for you know, putting those yeah. up to me. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Mr. Rado? So even with the risk manager knowing this, the, like the snorkeling, mm -hmm. he feels that's okay, it's not a risk? He said as is. It was an eight to one ratio of the guide to the individuals. He mentioned all the PPE, so the goggles, the mouthpiece, both are cleaned right in front of you. The vest and flippers, um, they do a how-to before they even get into the water, and then they can go into the water to see the various um, ecosystems that they've learned about outside. One of the tour women that I went or told you that had already been on the trip actually was uncomfortable herself, so therefore she felt her, she actually tethered herself to one of the guides. And say a student by chance, because they've never been in this type of experiment, um, doesn't enjoy it, we can have one of our chaperones stay on the boat with them and we can always switch off if we want to. I also spoke with another ag center, the Sound School in New Haven. They go to Bermuda every year with their students because it's obviously a lot of aquaculture related. And if you wanted me to do this, I would be happy to do that. Um, they actually offer like a, um, a snorkeling class prior. So therefore they get a little bit more comfortable in the water before even going into experience. You would do that? Sure, we got it right on Route 5. Yeah. I, I understand this is snorkeling, not diving. Yes. The, yes. They, they stay on the they surface. They stay on the surface. <laughs> they have the vest, they float. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Let's get, take consensus on our trip <coughs> to Belize, starting with Mr. Votto. <laughs> I can, I, I can, <laughs> can come back to you. Yeah. I can come back to you. Yes. 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 Snorkeling thing, they don't. Ray, what was your question? Snorkeling stays on the surface, surface. of the water. They right. don't go it's underwater. They just put their face underwater. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. With reservation, yes. <laughs> thank you all. Thank all you. Right. Appreciate thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, trip to Spain. Let's talk about Spain. Yes, Maria Di Virgilio yeah, has been. Um, for a number of years offering this trip every other spring break for students at Lyman Hall and Sheehan who are studying <coughs> Spanish. So we'll let her tell you about her experience. Hello. 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 I've been teaching at Lyman Hall for the past 29 years. It's nice to see some of you again. <laughs> and this will be um, my upcoming trip in 2021 will be my ninth trip with students to Spain. The last trip was in uh, 2019. Each time I go, I tweak the itinerary a little bit based on parent and chaperone and student feedback immediately after the trip. There hasn't been any tweaking from 2019 to this trip because I didn't get any comments back that resulted in me wanting to change anything. So it's pretty much the same trip as the last time as 2019. Questions? Same itinerary, same activities. Oh. 
questions? Ms. Levesque? I do have one. I'm looking at the expected number of students participants, 35 to 60. I know. That's <laughs> a lot. There were um, 54 students the last on, time in April of 2019. It is larger than the past trips I've taken. We actually took two buses. I've always filled a bus. I've had between uh, 25 and 40 students in the past, except for the very last trip where there were 54 students, which required two buses. It worked well, though. Oh, okay. That's sounds great. Excuse me, Mr. Do you think you'll have any problem getting chaperones with that many kids? There were no problems at all. I actually had a waiting list of chaperones. Good for you. Yes. <laughs> the hardest part is choosing who to allow to come as a chaperone. Any other questions? Let's take consensus. Let's start with Mr. Ross. Yes. 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 And you could start with me again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, hand signal for me to sit over here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And where are we? We're on F? Yes. We are on F. Okay. Italy. Our, our kids are going all over the place. Tell us about Italy. Um, this is an opportunity that Michelle Wolfram, a seventh grade teacher at Moran, is putting forward for middle school students at Moran and Dag um, to go, again, through education first to Italy this coming summer. Gosh. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michelle Wolfram, seventh grade language arts teacher at Moran. Um, this is my second trip that I'm <coughs> offering for our middle school students uh, at Moran and Dag. Last year, I went to London and Paris this past summer. Um, it was amazing. Uh, it was very, uh, it was challenging to uh, plan, but at the end, every hard work, everything paid off because um, our students, I just saw the students that were on the trip become more independent, um, become uh, very in interested and uh, involved in their own trip. They wanted to see a lot more. Um, they wanted to travel more. I had students ask me, when can we travel with you again? Um, <laughs> they're in high school now, so they'll go on the high school trips. Um, but so I just really wanted to continue this. I felt really refreshed on it as a teacher. It was something that was a little different than the experiences in the classroom. You always have those aha moments in the classroom, but this was something that I had an experience before. So I want to take our eighth grade students to Italy, um, and uh, we're going to see Rome, and uh, I almost said Paris, but sorry, that's not right. Rome, uh, Pisa, Venice, and Florence. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Questions? Shivata. I, I, I apologize. Sure. I what do you teach right now? Uh, seventh grade language arts. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm Michelle. Yep. <laughs> Corinne is my uh, my EF coordinator. Okay. She's the one who's coordinating my trip. Yep. I was going to ask you if you speak Italian, but I guess not. Well, I, no. <laughs> I took French in uh, high school, so. It's harder out there with students high. Yes. And will be a low cost. Yeah. Um, do, you, do the children know about this yet? Uh, yes. I, I would imagine. Yeah. Have you, have, you, have you had a lot of interest? I have uh, 36. Uh, 36. 36 people, <laughs> students and parents who are interested. Yeah, interested. yes. That was and my question, um, parents, that was my question, parents are yes. offered the opportunity to attend also? Yes. Just parents or siblings offered or just students just, plus a parent? Just the parents okay. as of right now. Yeah, I wanted to keep it eighth grade for just um, to know the students mm -hmm. um, in, yeah, in Dag and Moran as a middle school trip. So a um. parent can be a chaperone? Parent, um, I'm, I offer them as a traveler, as a, as a, a like, as to come, traveler, yes, as a traveler. No, uh, chaperones, I, uh, colleagues. I trust okay. the colleagues to come. I, I yeah. So when parents mm. attend, how does the rooming situation work? Does the parent stay with their child, or? They can. Um, it is offered through EF. Um, if they wanted to stay with uh, their, their student, they can. Um, I encourage uh, students to room with students uh, as it is a student, kind of a, an experience for the students to go away and experience what it's like to be on those sort of, but um, parents do choose to room with their students and yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Votto. As long as your uh, agency is here, <laughs> uh, my question is, is there a discount for more than one child per family? Um, we do offer a discount if the family reaches out. It's not something that's standard in the booking 
conditions, but we've offered that um, and feel like we've been sort of taken advantage of that in the past through the district. So mm -hmm. if there is one student, we can give, if they have two students going, we can give each of them $100 off of the trip. Same goes for if parents are going, you know, if they have three people going, um, we are happy to provide them that scholarship to get okay. investment in these programs. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? take consensus on Italy starting with Mr. Votto yes 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 thank you thank you okay thank you Kim and your department appreciate it um, okay so our next curriculum coordinator is Kate O'Donnell correct yep. the science so we'll start with um, removing applied chemistry I am Kate O'Donnell. I'm the Science and Technology Curriculum Coordinator. Unfortunately, I have to follow all these fun trips. <laughs> but I hope you'll, you'll bear with me. It's a, it's a little drier over here. Um, so the first item um, for science is the deletion of the applied chemistry course. Um, it hasn't run since 2017, 2018. Um, and there have been no requests for it since it hasn't run because this course was replaced by the physical science course, which currently runs. So students who normally would have been in the applied chemistry course are now taking the physical science course, which is both chemistry and physics. Um, we felt that was a better um, focus for them with NGSS to have a little bit of chemistry and a little bit of physics. So that's why the course hasn't run and, and we don't intend to run the course again. So we thought it'd be a good idea to come to the board and get approval to do a course deletion so it wouldn't, you know, <coughs> muck, up, muck up the curriculum program guide if it wasn't gonna run anymore. Thank you, any questions? Let's take consensus starting with Ms. Allenson. Yes. 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 Okay, modifying physical science. So the physical science course um, was the one that well, I think we started it two years ago. Um, some parents and students expressed a concern about not wanting to take the course because it didn't have chemistry in the title. And they were concerned that colleges might not like it and might not view it the same way if it didn't have chemistry in the title. So we said, you know, it has chemistry and physics. We, you know, without changing the curriculum or the units, like really, we can just do a name change to help them feel better about what goes on their transcript. We don't know if colleges will view it any differently, so it really is just about the perception that students and parents had about the course. And so the name change would be from just physical science to physical science, conceptual exploration in chemistry and physics. Questions? Um, does, is, this a la is this considered a lab science? <coughs> According to NGSS, all sciences are now considered lab science. Awesome. And are we going to get that entire title on a transcript, or will it be? It's a, very abbreviated. much abbreviated. It is abbreviated, but has all the important points to get in what we need to get Chemistry in. Chemistry and physics will yeah. be on there. In partial form. It's phys, sci, chem, and phys. Right. <laughs> you are limited by characters yeah, on a transcript. I've seen, I've right. seen something like that on a transcript. Any other questions? Let's take consensus, starting with Mr. Votto. Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, computer science? Okay, so our next one, I don't know if you want me to do it grade level by grade level. Um, so our computer science course started at Moran, and Charlotte Robbins is a teacher. She apologizes. She intended to be here, but fell ill today and was not able to come. Uh, but she really wrote the curriculum um, when she started teaching the course last year. And then this year, we were able to expand the program to DAG. So the new teacher at DAG and she were able to kind of collaborate and tweak and um, get the curriculum where they wanted it to be. So they have two units that they teach within the trimester. Um, and it's run as um, a unified art. So they see the kids for one trimester and, you know, they. They can sign up. It's an option that they can sign up for. Excuse so, for a minute. Do we yes. have that copy? Mm. Some people don't. It doesn't it's really don't. the digital citizenship. Here, you wanna? Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. yeah is. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. I did. I did notice you, that computer science okay. is not on the cover, but <laughs> it will be. Oh, I see. Digital. All right. Got it. 
Yeah, so sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade all have a digital citizenship unit, <coughs> and it, it's kind of tricky for them to actually write these units because there's no guarantee that kids are gonna take it. They can take it once, and they can take it twice. They can take it sixth and seventh. They can take it sixth and eighth. They can never take it until they get to eighth. So, you know, we're trying to write a course where the kids take digital citizenship and the learning grows as the years continue. So they really worked hard on trying to get content that was appropriate for the grade level. You know, what they're doing in sixth grade in digital citizenship looks very different from what they're doing in eighth grade because eighth graders are out there more online. They start to have social media accounts. As soon as they turn 13, all of a sudden they can have accounts on these. So they really felt that they needed to address things very differently at the different grade levels when it, when it came to digital citizenship. In sixth and seventh grade, it was more about like how you interact with people online, like how you put something in your Google Docs and who sees that and you know, more of like our internal systems that we use. And then in eighth grade, it kind of becomes what your persona is on, on the outside your digital footprint. They start to really talk about and work on how do you develop that and what do you want people to see when they see you online. Um, so those are the three digital citizenship courses. And then that's actually a smaller part of the year. The bulk of the year is the units that are called computer science, which is also the name of the course. Um, and these are the coding. This is the, the bulk of the time that they spend with the kids they do on computer coding. In sixth grade, they do scratch programming and they use um, the platform called TechTrep to do the, it's called a Programming Foundations course and they follow that through sixth grade. Um, and then in seventh and eighth grade, they do Minecraft, um, oh, yes. make Microsoft Make Code, Microbits, and they do, and it kind of um, develops every year. So when they were writing the curriculum, th there's a lot of like, such as, such as because the technology changes so quickly and the platforms change so quickly, what the content that they're covering, whether it's conditionals or variables, that isn't going to change, but the platforms that they use to teach it will. So that's why you know some of the language is a little bit general when they're talking about what um, product that they're using to teach it, but the content itself stays consistent no matter, no matter what platform they use. Forgive my ignorance, but this digital citizenship grade six, for instance, is that part of Encore or part of the actual science course? It's an Encore course. Is, are they all? They're, they're all Encore course. Right, okay. Yep. Um, the eighth eighth grade digital citizenship, when um, we're they're tapping into social media, mm -hmm. are they required to have some sort of social media account in no. order to? They, they don't have to. They develop a web page that is not published. Okay. So they use that platform that's still safe for students. Okay. And if parents aren't comfortable with their children being out there, there's no requirement that they are. So they, they learn HTML coding and they write a web, so they actually kind of combine the two things. So in the coding course, they write a web page using HTML and then they use the digital citizenship to talk about what, what your digital footprint looks like online, but they do not publish them. Okay, thank you. Will any of the activities that they do in the, the Encore classes be related to the curriculum for either math or science? How are we moving towards integrating the computer science standards by the state into our regular classes? Well, these, they are ba these courses are based on the computer science standards, and so like K through eight, they're all aligned to the computer science standards. Um, the science courses don't really have that connection like they don't teach the content or how to use hardware that it's really not part of of what we do in the science courses the math I, I don't feel like I I would know the answer of how to do that and what they do with computer science I'd like to take consensus on both digital citizenship and computer science if we're okay with that. Mr. Votto? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, no, you're not done. No, we have grade 11 and 12 marine science units. Mm -hmm. That's you, right? Yep. I, I mistakenly thought that that was ag science at first, so. No. The next three courses are all science. It's marine science, 
astronomy two, and topics in biology. So when, when these three courses um, do gain approval, that will be the end of all the science courses K-12 that they will all be aligned with the next-gen science standards. Mm -hmm. These are the last three that we've been working on and um, getting them aligned. Okay, so let's start with marine science. Okay, so um, the marine science course is a half-year course. Um, we were considering looking at doing a second half-year course and dividing like the marine biology from the oceanography, um, but they decided they really weren't ready to do that at this time, that they really wanted to focus on getting the marine science aligned with the next-gen science standards first before they thought about, because oceanography doesn't really um, show up very much in the next-gen science standards, so they really wanted to teach this course in an NGSS way first before they considered separating the oceanography out into a separate course. Um, so um, there's actually quite a bit of dissections in these courses, which we make sure we tell people right up front in the curriculum planning guide. We always offer alternative options for students who don't feel comfortable with dissections, but there's a lot of them in this class. So if you were a student who really didn't want to do anything to do with dissections, we do tell you up front that there are a lot so that the parents and the students can be prepared for making that decision as a family. Um, but students are always offered options to not do those dissections. I didn't know if you noticed there were, there were quite a few in these yes. courses, particularly in the first two units, the marine invertebrates and the marine vertebrates yep. courses have quite a few. Um, it's a lot of uh, identifying parts and looking at structure and function are a big part. Um, those standards are really prevalent in the marine science courses. Um, then they do ocean resources and human impacts, which aligns with the earth science and the next-gen science standards. And then the, the fourth unit, the oceanography and zonation, is the one that they were really looking at and thinking about, could we blow this out and make it a half-year course? But at this point, it's just, it's just a singular unit within the marine science course. Questions, Ms. Lueck. What level is this? Uh, I know what grade level, but um, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I'm sorry, I didn't write that down. I believe it is, I think it's a level A course. Okay. CCP. CCP, CCP1. Oh. <laughs> Yes, we're going to get the hang of that. Yeah. We all we will are. get the hang of it. We can get it out of <laughs> the mouth. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Just a side note. My son dissected a squid in, uh, in a fifth grade nature's classroom, and we're still talking about it over a year later, the dissection <laughs> of the squid. So I suspect that there are a lot of kids that like the dissection part. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's take consensus on marine science, starting with Mr. Votto. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, so the next two, I have to add astronomy too to the, the cover. I apologize. So they are comparative planetology and life in the universe. It originally, they had it as three units, but there was so much overlap, they decided to collapse it down into two larger units. Um, so Astronomy 2 um, is the companion to Astronomy 1, which um, has been running. This one is now aligned to, uh, better to the uh, NGSS. Um, so they really get into looking at the different planet, different planet systems. Can there be life on other planets? What conditions are those? Um, life in the universe. They also do um, like ages of stars and um, the teachers who teach this course are so passionate about it. They love it. They're the earth science teachers who take that space systems unit and they, they just do unbelievable things with it. So it's great that they have the opportunity to take these courses and to go into all of those topics that they don't have time to do just in the earth science course at, at a, much, a much deeper level um, for those kids who are interested in their junior and senior year. It's also a half year course, um, CCP1. Questions? Okay, let's take consensus on astronomy units. Are you in Mr. Votto? Yes. 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 Um, topics in biology. So topics in biology, um, 
I believe it's CCP2, <laughs> um, is a full credit course. It's a one-year course. Um, and I, I know it has a lot of units, but some of them, like those units that are two and three weeks, are, they're very short units, like the one on organ donation. The students, um, it's, like, it's run like a research project. Most of these units are run that way. Um, the first couple units, the teacher models a lot of how to do research in the courses. And then as you go through like the nutrition and the organ donation and the national parks, they all become projects, almost um, like in the organ donation one, the students create a PSA about why people should donate their organs, the national parks, they do projects about why you should protect and save the national parks, why are they important for the ecosystem. So they really take these research topics and align them to biology. So it really brings biology alive for these students. Um, and because the, it's very project-based, um, it's great for um, scaffolding for students. You can really give them the support they need um, to, to learn the topics in this course. Um, and the teacher who teaches it just adores this course. She, she wrote it, she was like, I, I wanna do more and I wanna write extra units just in case I replace them. I'm like, no, we'll just stay with the first eight and then we'll, we'll come back if we have to. Um, but the, the students really, really enjoy and, and love, love this course. They feel successful in science. Um, you know, sometimes when students are at CCP2, they, they don't always feel successful. Um, science might not be easy for them, um, but this course is very attractive to them because it's very personalized which makes them be more engaged and more successful in the course. I don't have any questions. I just have a comment. I, I really appreciate the um, curriculum that is laid out here with national parks and tying it into life. Some of the best science classes that I ever took were like physics for today and, um, and basically giving an applied knowledge um, and with the way that the planet is going, um, it's really important to tie in a lot of those issues. Um, so just, you know, wanted to commend your work there. Thank you. Ms. Purcell. Yeah, I just want to comment too. I just, I absolutely love the topics in here. And I think it, it expands so many parts of the science. And um, when people think biology, they always think of, okay, you know, cells and that kind of thing. And, it, and I lo love the national parks. <laughs> I'm thrilled that you have nutrition in here because it's so underdone in our district. It really needs to be addressed. So I thought that was uh, awesome. And even the charity group stuff was great too. So good job. Thank you. Um, is this teacher, does she post most of, is she, is she on Google Classroom? Or she would like post these videos? So there's um, a lot, this is a really detailed yeah, when, when she wrote the course, because it, it's been running at Sheehan and hasn't been running at Lyman Hall, which is something that we're trying to work on to get um, it running, she put in all of the video links. Right. She has way, way more even yeah. than what's there, but just to help whoever the teacher was there to just be able to take the course and, and run with it. Um, but I, I don't think she posts them, posts them on Google Classroom. Okay. Um, being old school, uh, you know, I know <laughs> what biology courses were like when I was in school. Um, I wasn't that great at it either. But anyhow, um, do you feel that these other applied, the national parks and the bone, uh, uh, the donor thing, mm -hmm. uh, you don't feel it's taking away from the basic bio biology uh, curriculum that when I went to school, you know? The, the nitty gritty stuff. I mean, do you feel that that's being shortchanged in any way? This this is more of an additive to the to that. Additive. These these kids, um, like this is for what they would take in their junior and senior year. So th those kids would have already taken regular biology. So these are kids who are interested in Sorry. more yeah. biology. This is not a replacement <laughs> for. Well, that cake. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Take consensus on topics in biology, starting in the Shavato. Yes. 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 Thank, Thank you, you very. Thank you very much. Okay, so that concludes Ms. O'Donnell, correct? Yes. Okay, so we'll s we're moving into um, Mr. Kobe's area of expertise, correct? Correct. Cybersecurity. Tell us about cybersecurity. 
Uh, good evening, I'm Rob Covey. I'm the Career and Technical Education Coordinator. Um, I'm gonna speak on M and N together, because uh, they're related. Uh, N, we're deleting computer repair and we're replacing with cybersecurity. Um, the reason for that uh, is that we are trying to get new and better and more rigorous opportunities. Uh, cybersecurity is a very important and growing field and uh, it pays a lot better as, as a field than computer repair. Um, but the curriculum for computer repair, the first three units, is understanding operating systems, and you can't even begin to understand what the threats are to cybersecurity if you don't understand the operating systems. So um, the curriculum for cybersecurity will be coming later this year. Uh, we're pretty well through that because of the relation to the the first three units of computer repair, um, but after just understanding operating systems and so forth, we'll get a little bit into identifying what are threats, how, how threats uh, become an issue, and then how do you prevent threats. It's not, um, a lot of people ask, or students think that, oh, we're going to learn to be hackers, or, or, or avoid being <laughs> hackers, or, oh, this is about hacking, oh and um, <laughs> that's not exactly what it is. <laughs> <coughs> Questions, Mr. Votto? So they will get a little bit of the other, the, the uh, well, like you said, computer, computer repair, repair, but some of the technology with this new course in the beginning. Is that what you said? Right. The first few, you, you, for, uh, first few units of uh, cybersecurity cover, cover that. understanding how computers work. Um, and uh, that's, you have to understand how computers work in cybersecurity. Yeah, right. So. Okay. Will cybersecurity, oh, did somebody have their hand up? Okay. Will cybersecurity be a full year or a half year course? Half year course. That's is what computer repair is a half year. So it's one for year. one replacement. Is it cybersecurity, will it be eligible for um, college credit, community college credit yet? Uh, it's not yet. Okay. Uh, it's new and growing, and mm -hmm. what connections might be available are not there yet. Um, but the textbook that uh, we're, I'll be bringing to you um, is aligned and geared, uh, the one that we want to uh, propose approval for you, is um, connected to um, a certificate. So okay. they could a actually get a, a, a certificate if a student pursues it, and a half credit course to really get into it. One of the things with the certificates in cybersecurity especially, um, they're not uh, cheap, and uh, they also have to be renewed pretty often um, so that you can be a certified person. They have to be kept up to date. Mm. So the question is, how far do we, if for students, there's the opportunity for students to pursue that, but how far we want to push students towards getting that certificate in high school when by the time they graduate or could actually use it, the certificate may be expired. Um, we may not do that. Does a person teaching it have to have the certificate? No. Okay. One of our teachers actually is uh, completing a master's in cybersecurity. So he's been the one that's been working on outlining the course. And, and like I said, it's mostly understanding what are threats. It's not getting deep into actually preventing them and doing the, uh, the computer work, but like securing networks and what are the what are the ways that the threats become uh, you know, like s understanding things like phishing and phishing attacks and how do you educate your people within a network to avoid those kinds of attacks and, and stuff like that so it won't be necessarily we're not going to go real deep while we'll talk about it into the actual networking if there were going to be cybersecurity too it would be like networking uh, but we won't be in this course going that far any other questions? Let's take consensus on both approving cybersecurity and deleting computer repair, starting with Mr. Votto. Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, so deleting intro to computer science and approving AP computer science, is that a one-to-one -one thing or no? Um, not exactly a one-to-one. -one. The intro, of, I'll just give you the history. It, it's related. Um, the history of where we were with intro to computer science, we had no middle school computer teachers 
Um, so we put that course in. It's not a highly technical course. It's an important course because it really covers a lot of good and valuable information to let kids, uh, to, for kids to know. As we have expanded with the middle school courses, some of the things that would be an introduction to computer science would be covered in middle school. So we have the potential for that for students coming from the middle school for that redundancy. In addition, we want to, again, like the cybersecurity, we want to expand more rigorous opportunities. And our goal for, uh, since I've started here, was to try and get AP computer science and to have teachers that are prepared and uh, able to teach that. And we're, we're at that point now. So because of the middle school computer science courses, we're going to eliminate the introduction to computer science, and we're going to make room in the catalog uh, for AP computer science. So that's. Questions? I actually have a question. So what if my middle school student has band and resource and maybe doesn't have the opportunity to take an introductory course during their encore, which is one of three I mean, Encore is, they only get it one of three terms. So they don't have the opportunity to do it, but by the time they're a junior, they have a new found, or, you know, they're interested in it, but they don't want to go into an AP course. What are their options? They want some sort of computer science, but maybe not AP. What are their options? We have computer programming for Python, and we have the cybersecurity course, and um, then the next course after that. Another one that we'll look at as where it may fit in is the dilemma we faced a couple of years ago, because the path that we, we were involved with a consortium grant for training for teachers to encourage and promote computer science in schools, and it re centered around three courses, exploring computer science. When we added it, some of the principals didn't like the word exploring, thought it was too juvenile. We called it introduction to computer science, but it's aligned to what's called ECS, or exploring computer science. That's the first course. The second course, right after intro to computer science, that this consortium was uh, recommending in a pathway was um, AP computer science principles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is not like any AP course that you could ever imagine, except it has this wonderful, nice AP label on it. It is not rigorous. There is no direct coding, or you don't learn a specific programming language. You can use Scratch, which many of our kids have been using in elementary and middle school and it's got this AP wrapper on it that doesn't, most colleges will not give them any computer science related credit for. Um, so, and it's less rigorous than our current computer programming class, which is CCP1. So, we were stuck with the dilemma of, do we add an AP course that's actually less rigorous than a CCP1 course we already have? So we kind of were reluctant to put that in there. In addition, our computer uh, programming courses are in technology education, and we, with the courses we have, we have 29 courses in the catalog. So if we keep adding courses, then it gets, we start to run into issues of who's going to teach it or how do we teach it, and we fit it in there. Um, so... Um, so we so to, to 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 your question originally is like what options are there? We're still looking at as adding the AP computer science principles course, but we didn't want to jump on that one first because it's actually like I said less rigorous than the course that we already have. Um, but introductory to computer science, as we delete that, is not there's not an essential knowledge or skills in that course for them to for a student to take the other courses that we have. You don't need introduction to computer science to start taking computer programming in Python. Uh, and you don't need introduction to co uh, computer science to jump right in and take AP um, Java. Uh, it's not recommended for some students. Might work. Uh, in our course description for the AP, we say we recommend that you take computer programming in Python, so you learn a computer programming language, and you move from there into the Java language. So, computer programming is tech ed, correct? Computer programming is? But in, uh, AP computer science, is that considered a math course? Uh, no. That's a tech ed course. Yes. 
It all depends on what, uh, we, in Wallingford, we have not uh, given math credit for computer science courses in a very long time. I don't know specifically. There was a time, a long time ago, that they would um, consider a computer programming course uh, uh, on par with geometry. But that has not been the Wallingford way for a very long time. It's been standard practice that math courses are taught by math teachers. So none of our math teachers are teaching the computer sciences courses or programming? No. So this class was just approved in 2017. Intro to computer science, yes. Yes. Um, and at that time, it was, I, I spoke against it, so I kind of remember a little bit about this. At that time, it was um, sold as a prerequisite to the AP Computer Science A. Is that no longer the case? I don't think we've ever, there's nothing in there that it was a prerequisite. I, I don't re recall ever saying prerequisite um, because we actually have no prerequisites uh, for um, if there's recommendations to take algebra or to take computer uh, programming, but that's our only prerequisites. Okay. It was a pathway that we were trying to build. That was my next question. So pathway and like the path, the, a core sequence versus prerequisite. And that's what I meant by the three-fold plan that the state had, when we first got involved with that consortia grant mm -hmm. to promote computer science, they were setting it up with this is the three core sequence. Right. Exploring computer science, AP computer science principles, and, um, and then AP Java. And that was our goal when we wanted to get that. So being new into that, we went in, we brought teachers to be trained in it. Um, we uh, included it, we had long conversations about the course itself. Uh, we recognized that it wasn't rigorous, but we all f felt that it covers good topics. Um, for example, one of the, the first one is uh, human and computer interaction and understanding what is computer science. There are so many notions as to what is computer science. What is a computer? Uh, you know, is a microwave a computer? Yes, it is. But people don't think of that as computers. It's not just the little box that sits on your desk or the laptop and so forth. So you get into the whole, uh, that whole concept. Uh, data is in that course. What is data? How is data used? So they're valuable things, but you don't need to know about what is a computer, what is the world of computer science to learn Python programming. You don't, it, you don't need to. It. It's a valuable opportunity to really understand. If you start to learn coding and programming in Python and really understand what is computer science, it could be valuable to think, well, how can I use programming for other things? But if you want to just learn to code a computer, you don't necessarily need to have that. I agree. Um, 29 courses currently, but not all those courses run. 21. So are there opportunities? Like it, it feels like we're trying to swap one with the other. And to, I mean, we had Ms. Moore here earlier, and you know, on the world language side, we're now bringing in an academic level or CP whatever level of um, CCP one. Thank you. Um, to make sure that we have opportunities for all students and taking away an academic level intro to computer science, I worry that this could also, like what are we going to put in that will make sure that any student, regardless of whether or not they want to go down the pathway, will get some exposure should they, should they choose, and I'm not necessarily in favor of intro to computer science because I do think they get exposure to this in other ways, but I don't want it to just be a top sided <coughs> honors and AP pathway. Oh, I totally agree, and that's why I, when I said if we have a, a second computer, uh, a, a second to cybersecurity, it would be networking, so that's another consideration. Um, but to the point that with the 21 courses in the, and that some don't run, we have courses in the catalog that don't run now. Not that they don't ever run, they don't run consistently, and we have years where the courses run and then the years where they go off. So the question then becomes, are we going to add more courses to it that then becomes this kind of round robin cycle of what may run? And it gets wild for the teachers where there's something on the books 
that hasn't run in two years and then it comes up and then it runs and it's like, oh, I haven't taught. I get it. Uh, and then we've had some enrollments go up and we moved the teacher from Sheehan to Lyman Hall and then so then a, a teacher who hasn't taught graphics in four years is teaching graphics. And then somebody moves to uh, Lyman Hall and we had a switch and because if you look at what is in the technology education catalog, it goes from auto shop to AP, with this, it would go to AP computer science programming. Mm -hmm. So we have CAD and CAM and manufacturing and architecture. And uh, so I, like for example, I have a teacher at Lyman Hall right now who's teaching robotics. No, not, he's not teaching, he's teaching CAD, intro to computer science, architecture, and residential construction. Mm -hmm. So that's so that's why we're very why I speak about the 21 and the one for one because I'm very cognizant of the fact that it can get wild quick and for our teachers. And it can also get wild for the students who want to be in that pathway. If you have a student who wants to do computer science and they get stuck in architecture because the other classes that they want to take aren't running that year, that's a demotivator also. So there's a, there, it goes both ways. Well, it I gets into like why they don't run because the enrollment isn't in there. That's, that's the other thing. And so that's one of the reasons why we're trying to, for a computer repair, put something a little bit more rigorous, hopefully motiv motivating students to be attractive so we get courses with high enrollments um, so that we don't have an up and down, like architecture seems to go up and down at Sheehan. Well, that's, um, as a parent who had an architecture student, that's by default because there's nothing else to take. Um, so I would like to see, and I hope as our STEM pathway, as our STEM town moves forward, we can get a pathway for computer science, just like we have for advanced manufacturing, for culinary. I mean, the state has a computer science strategic plan. Um, they've adopted the ISTE standards. I mean, these are things that on the state level, and I know you're working on it, and I know there's a lot of pieces to it. I know we've recruited some phenomenal teachers to help move the district forward in this area. Um, but that's really, before we say that the enrollment goes up and down, maybe there needs to be a student survey as to why are you taking this class? Does it fill a half credit because you have to and you have to get a certain amount of seat time? Or is this really a class that you've been waiting for and you want to take? Mm -hmm. Because that also plays into the fact of having 21 classes and you know, we obviously know that the higher up you go in grade level, you get the first pickings of the classes. But there are times that students want a particular class and they can't get it. So they put it off to the next year and then it's not available if it doesn't run. And they're taking classes just for seat time. It's a complicated if puzzle. That, if there's not enough interest in a particular course and the numbers aren't there, what do you do? It's a, it's a complicated so that system. That, that, I agree. If there's not enough interest, fine. But are they taking other courses just because they have to have a certain number of credits? Probably. Whereas if we offered more sessions of the popular courses that students can't get into, would they take those instead? Well, that's got to be, we got to find that out. So the, don't the offer other thing two is or three architectures, offer more of... The, the, other, the other thing to consider also is the curriculum planning guide, the way it was updated last year and structured, is to look at the opportunities also that aren't um, necessarily just tech ed courses that are related, you know, uh, mathematics courses, statistics courses, um, et cetera, to have those, those courses. It, it's an elective, CTE 100% across the board is an elective area. And the conversations that we have repeatedly, and we haven't necessarily come, I hear your point and I totally understand that, but we repeatedly have these questions about this ebb and flow and what, and, and there's, there's a feeling sometimes of if you mess too much with a course and it turns out to be a course that kids don't like, you know, we ask students what are they liking, then what will happen to enrollment? Uh, and we've had teachers who have been for, uh, rift in the past. So th this happens in my bi uh, when I talk to my business teachers. Um, some of my business teachers, ha um, they were rift, um, and they're we like, shouldn't be ordering, offering courses that students don't want for the sake of not riffing a teacher. I, I don't want it to come uh, around. I, 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 don't. That's, I, I, I don't want it to sound like that. That's not what. I, so I, that's not. We're not making decisions on that, but. 
what motivates kids to take courses, changes, and it's not always based on just, well, they're taking the courses they want. It's the, it could be the teacher that's teaching the course. Mm -hmm. It's what course their friends are in. Yeah. It's what course their True. friends said they loved and they should go and take. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a moving uh, it's a target. target. And we, we're, we're completely aware of that. I hear what you're saying. We're having these conversations and trying to figure out what is the best courses that we can put in place and that our teachers could uh, teach. And maybe a Google form or a survey. What courses have you wanted to take that you couldn't because of your schedule? I'll tell you from my experience at Sheehan, you had to pick between advanced CAD or statistics, AP statistics too, because it was, they both ran only once against each other. And if you were on a college track, you were gonna take the AP to get the college credits. You weren't gonna take the advanced CAD, even though that might've been a higher interest for you. So that's a whole nother thing that's about a whole nother what complication that's another scheduling. piece of the puzzle but again until we unpeel those layers and we understand what motivates students to take these classes we don't know on some of these changes whether we're truly satisfying the needs of the mm -hmm. students i mean i'm in favor of any addition in computer science course so mm -hmm. i mean that that piece of it is is a no-brainer for me but i do worry about you know deleting some courses that are on the academic level for students who may not, like Aaron said, if you're in band and you're in other activities and you just wanna dabble in computer science, you know, you could do a half credit, but sometimes those half credits don't really fit in your schedule. Mm -hmm. and, and there's the other side is sometimes you need the half credits to fit in the schedule because they don't always fit, but sometimes they need to fit. And then that's the other side that we hear is that, well, we have these wide course catalog with half credits and full credits so that kids can make it work, but then sometimes it doesn't work because the scheduling, that's, we, didn't, we don't want to even get into scheduling because that's a whole nother thing when it does fit up that it, it's up against another course that you want right. to take. That's a whole nother animal. Um, but I, like I said, I totally hear what you're saying, um, but I, 100% believe that introduction to computer science is not the course we leave in so that we have uh, academic opportunities for students. Um, but we are continue to explore that. I just want to make a general comment. Um, with enrollment declining at both schools, I think we're going to run into those scheduling issues more often in terms of singleton courses. Just a comment. I think both okay. high school administrations are looking at course requests, um, the ebb and flow of course requests in general, and looking at, in some cases, um, when you have a robust course catalog, do you look at planning out a way where you offer a class every other year, you know, on off years, <coughs> so that you don't run into too many classes with low enrollments that then wind up not running at all? and you build, you know, you have to plan that out well in advance so people know when it's being offered, but that you do get to take the courses that you wanna take without the fear of it's not gonna run because there's not enough kids in the class. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that they're discussing now. You make a good point. It's something that I didn't even think of when you said the Google form for what they wanna take. The course requests the students should put down on the request, well, what course do you want to take? And that does gauge a lot on what, um, what we offer and, and not offer or what we try and promote or try to get in there is course requests. And you're saying that's, when, course request, you're saying when you set up your initial schedule, like when you're requesting what you want. Right. Okay, then all of that needs to be captured so that counselors don't sit down to key it in as to what the requests are it's full they go to the second one they need to put in everything that's there first request the counselors don't do it uh, because it's all the students sign up themselves and then it spits out all what the requests are so they're and not are they like here availability or do they not sign up if the class is full the students mm -hmm. the they students. don't see the availability okay. they just sign up it says what courses do you want to take and then they come in and sit down with their counselor but that course picking goes on um, before in, in the system. 
the yeah. students pick their courses and then they sit. And then when they sit with their counselor, when they have their courses picked, it won't even get on their schedule if that class is full. So you don't even know how large of a waiting list you have. No, I'm pretty certain that they do know how many requests there were, what they're able to um, accommodate, and then what their, you know, their next level choice is and all of that. Because they, they start doing that in February. Yeah, I was going to say January. I mean, quite honestly, and it, and it takes them all the way through May and June. I mean, it's huge. So they do get an initial, um, an initial idea of there's, you know, 95 requests for this one class. Um, and and how it's structured and then what the second request is and, and so on so um, you know each building has um, one of the admins kind of honed in on scheduling and do you see that so just sticking with the example I don't care architecture yeah if there's 95 and there's only two sessions of 20 <coughs> running do you see there's 50 requests or somebody is, is it doesn't work that, that way that you use oh there's only two sessions it goes how many requests and then it creates the sections so Correct. if there's a hundred requests then it spits out and says well there's going to be four sections of that let's say of, of 25 based on what the sections are set as for what what's the max number so if a, like a tech ed course they're usually like a woodshop course has a, a, a limit of 20 students. So if 80 students want wood, then it says, boom, there's four sections in the schedule. Then they work it. Uh, so the first, it doesn't say, ooh, we, we don't start out with saying we're gonna have two sections of right. wood. The requ course requests right. tell you, this is how many sections you have, and then you make it all work. Something Don't isn't think clicking with me then, because if that's the case, then why would you run a, why would you end up with a class of eight or ten students then, non AP? Let's just like, why would you, if it's based so on requests? Here is, it, it's quite complicated to be honest, and it's taken me all three years that I've been here to well, really I'm a graduate, look and at, I'm still asking no, questions. No, I know. So. <laughs> but you know what happens is. Um, really starting around April where you start to look at how many sections and, and what the enrollment is in each section and then and how, how it works within the schedule. Um, and so you can look at, you know, there's 50 kids who want AP computer science and you know that you're gonna be running two sections, that's 25 kids in a class, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that could be all fine and dandy buttoned up with a bow. Right. And then over the summer or right before school starts, you know, kids add drop and then say, you know, 25 kids drop, I'm just saying. And then you have two sections of 25 and now you have, instead of two classes of 25, you have two sections with 13 and 12. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it gets to be a little bit, there, there is a factor in which um, you, you, it's never, you know, quite solid. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, you know, Danielle, Dr. Menzo, and I will sit down and we'll look from the spring at class size and enrollment and what courses are running and what courses are not. Um, and then it looks totally different in a month. And then at the start of school, it looks totally different again. So, um, you know, high school scheduling is, is incredibly complicated. Um, and I'm wondering if perhaps it, it might, um, you know, it might be, be of interest to the board to have one of the high school admin kind of come in and, and walk through the scheduling process <coughs> at, you know, maybe the next instructional committee meeting or the one in March, just so that you can kind of get a sense of from course selection to final section size and, and class size, what the process is that they go through, just to give you kind of a sense of how do they determine if a course runs or if a course doesn't run. How do, you, how, do you, how do you determine if you have 75 kids um, want to take a particular class and you know that you are, you, you're schedule-wise are running two sections of it, you know, how that next level class gets picked, that type of thing. So I don't know if that's something that would be of interest to the board. After um, SRBI. Also, also <laughs> Tammy, so you, 
So if 50 kids want to take um, a course and they make two sections of it, it doesn't mean all 50 kids are going to actually get into that. And I think that's probably the disconnect because based on all their other selections, the computer's running an algorithm mm -hmm. to make the best possible schedule for all 600 kids in the building. So some of those kids that requested to take computer science A may not get into it because it conflicts with the forensics and which is you know it could be a singleton course and they have to make that decision like between architecture and statistics because there may have only been three kids who picked both of those things mm -hmm. and they have to make that decision right um, and then how you structure your schedule also <coughs> makes a difference in how it spits out the schedule so that if you lock in particular classes to certain periods because you know through trend experience that you can't run them at the same period. You know, there's a lot of factors mm, to it. So. Um, I think another factor I think is your availability or lack of availability of, of teachers. To so right. teacher. <coughs> you know, to teach a particular course. Or you might have more, more, too many kids for one course and you don't have a teacher to teach the other, the other class. Correct. So I mean, it's. And then we have teachers science, teaching a six course. Class size at a certain um, well, certain well, amount well, because it's it's a, it's a OSHA guideline. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of contributing factors to scheduling and what runs and what doesn't. Are teachers allowed to teach one course out of their uh, major anymore? Is that not allowable anymore? <coughs> not that I'm aware of. No. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Levesque. This, that might be a helpful idea when we're looking at budgeting and how things go to, to help us to understand a little bit better about. Sure. I'm sure uh, Ken Daly generally <coughs> is the one that's deep into scheduling at Lyman Hall. Mm -hmm. um, and Justin does it for, Justin Marciano does it for Sheehan. So I, um, I'm more than happy to request that they maybe do a little mini presentation. Um, when I, you know, we'll ask them Tuesday when we see them. Yeah, that, that might be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll figure out a good date, whatever works for okay. the board. Okay. Any other questions? I forget what, what. what We're on uh, oh, the okay. deletion of introduction to computer <laughs> science. Okay, all right, let's take consensus on deleting intro to computer science. Starting with Mr. Votto. Uh, yes. 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 Thank you. All right, we'll see if we could do these a little more quickly. PQR, all related, AP Computer Science. So P is the approval to add it, because we want to add that course. Q is the curriculum for that course. It is the AP Computer Science curriculum straight from the college board. Okay. It's robust, it's good. Um, we provided that prior to the December meeting uh, here in the office because it is, yeah, it's large. Um, so there it is, right, uh, right there. And this was the email that I sent um, where we linked the curriculum to you instead of printing a hard copy. Right. Right. And then also, which is not usually the sequence that we do, but because this is an AP class and a lot of it is dictated, right. the, um, the curricular resource, and that's why I have textbook approval in parentheses, because right. it's really not a textbook, it's online, but it is the resource that would be used to implement the curriculum, all of that was provided to you via email prior to the December meeting to give you plenty of time to review it and watch the YouTube video if you so desired. Yeah, and that's that's the, was my next statement is that it really is textbook in parentheses or, or quotes because um, what that is, it's a complete online uh, resource and the College Board approves it as a quote unquote textbook even though it's online and it really is videos and instruction and a, a closed, uh, meets all the privacy uh, standards and so forth, so students can even um, uh, post questions of other students for help and collaboration, and there's tremendous resources for teachers in there as well, where teachers can actually post questions to other teachers, especially in a field like computer science, where maybe they're not, they're not computer scientists, they have <coughs> that resource um, available to them to reach out to other computer science uh, instructors. Um, so th I'm very, I think, uh, I'm very pleased with that as a collection there. Questions? 
comments? Let's take consensus to approve uh, PQR. Starting with Mr. Votto. Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, do you do animal technology? I do. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I will explain this because S and T go together. So animal science is a broad field. And to simplify it, um, what we want to do is to break it into two pathways because there is, as I was uh, first explained uh, to, um, we want to, instead of animal technology, we want to have two, two paths, companion animal and veterinary science. And as it was first explained to me, companion animal is the warm and cuddly, uh, and vet science is the blood and guts. <laughs> So in the broad field of animal science, there are students that get through and say, oh, I really like the warm, I don't want to get into the more vet side of things. Um, so we're providing that opportunity for our students to choose what are they most interested in within the field of animal science. The companion pa animal pathway, which will be one, two, three, four, the warm and cuddly or the vet science, which is the more technical, as they said, blood and guts, but it's not really exactly. Um, so that would be the veterinary science. The good thing for us is that the first two years of both pathways are the same curriculum. But we want to group the students together into the course that meets with uh, students all having the same goals going through. So animal, uh, the companion animal one and two and veterinary science one and two, they all have to cover the same things. Um, and then where the real divergence will become uh, um, will be in three and four, and that will enable us time to complete that three and four curriculum as students are moving through their more distinct uh, paths. Ms. Allison? Um, do you think that will further dilute the um, class size capabilities and the, our ability to fill up um, these pathways? Uh, my concern is if we're talking about dilution of the computer science and how we take other things because we don't want to take them like how, how I know that this isn't a related field but do you then end up like completely diverging from what you're you were looking at as computer science because the only thing available to you was a uh, companion animal this one is a little different though because this is in egg science right. so um, it's, it's I, I would exactly say no, because uh, already knowing we are, because the kids have the interest, we have two sections of the animal technology course. So they, th within the scheduling of it, they've already said, well, what, what are you most interested in? We'll put you together. Um, so the courses are full and they'll just continue and carry through. And ag science courses are usually a little bit smaller than our normal uh, big course. And it's specialized. It's, it's the thing that people come here um, and they do a lot, a tremendous job to promote and recruit students uh, to, that come here specifically for that. And it's not just our Wallingford kids. Uh, yeah, sure. We pull from all over. And uh, I don't know, where do we pull from? If you want. So I have uh, the two uh, uh, teachers here. If they could speak to that question. I'm Casey Dalzen. I work at Lyman Hall High School in the Ag Science Department. I'm currently one of the two animal technology teachers. And Hi again. <laughs> <laughs> so I teach the veterinary science um, loaded that we're hoping to get added on, and I would teach the companion animal science. Um, both are very science rigorous, but the small animal sections and animal science in general, because that also includes our large animal uh, component with Ms. Marcello, who's not here this evening, um, is our <coughs> largest draw. Uh, most of the applications that we receive in the ag science program are for students entering the ag, uh, excuse me, the animal science field. And so offering them this uh, split gives them better opportunity <coughs> to really explore if veterin veterinary science is for them or if maybe it's not. And isn't it better to do that in high school and know that definitively before you start spending thousands of dollars you know, at the collegiate level? Mm -hmm. And so that's Completely kind of our agree. goal is to give them that experience yeah. ahead of time. And mm -hmm. so you know, both classes do dissections, both classes explore the biology, the behavior, and the science. We do it from a different slant and different perspective with a different focus because students might, not, might know in eighth grade that, that science is not for them. They don't want to do the medical side, but they still love animals and they want to explore those opportunities. And that's what the split is really hoping to accomplish here. Awesome. Ms. Purcell. 
Just a quick question under budget and staffing that talks about a pending ASTE um, operating grant, Perkins, the Perkins grant. What's going on with that? Yes, no? I would answer it because. Well, I'm just saying under animal technology, it just said the acquisition of new equipment that you're pending a grant, a future Perkins grant. Well, the Deep equipment, on the well, bottom. we get a lot of equipment from the ag grants and the Perkins grants, and oh. so the purchase of that comes through there, and it's pending as we submit that, and then it gets approved, and then. So it's not a big deal to get that. No, every year when they submit, uh, they just have to go through the approval process. Okay. And so if, um, like our Perkins grant just got awarded, uh, they will send us back, revisions needed, they ask questions, you make some tweaks, you send it back, and then, right. so usually yes, it's a non-issue. Okay. Yeah, it, it, we just have to submit the application and just, to, and the application basically demonstrates that we're doing what is expected. And then we use the money. So it's kind of pending the approval. Everything gets, gets, gets pre-approved. Correct. So. Got it. Okay. Mr. Vado? Could you just do me a favor and explain the credits again? When you, uh, when you say explain <laughs> the credits. In other words, four equals the last one. Four equals two. Now I'm, I'm assuming four is sure. the level four. Yeah, so freshman year. So... It's a four-year curriculum, so first year, it's an every other day schedule, so they only get a half of credit. For sophomore and junior year, they actually have one and a half because it's for half the year is every other day, while the other half of the year, it's every day. And for seniors, it is two credits because it meets every day all year round. So it's two credits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so we are going to take consensus on S and T together. Is that correct? Yes. yes. All right, Mr. Votto. Well, is is T veterinary science? Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, it's change. S -R. Yeah, it's R S. And yeah. R -S. yeah, the it's paper the ones don't have the right yeah, letters on top. Right, so on the last I want to just make sure I'm okay in yeah. everything. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. This concludes the Rob Covey part of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Publix UVW. You have the floor. Good evening. I'm Carrie Ladadio, the Secondary Humanities Coordinator. And I'm going to start with item U, which is the proposed deletion of high school um, English elective intro to public speaking. It's a half year English course that's being pro proposed for deletion because it has not run for uh, several years at either high school. Um, and the primary skills that are emphasized in the course have been embedded and emphasized in the English language arts curriculum across the board due to Common Core with the public speak, uh, the speaking and listening standards. Questions, Ms. Purcell? Yeah. Um, I get how most of these are into English language, but job college interviewing, is that, where's that? It's part of the course description yep. in this one, but where does that happen? We do a good deal of that in our senior English seminar. Okay. Other questions? Okay, let's see consensus on deleting public speaking, starting with Mr. Votto. No, I just wanted to say that I think I'm, I'm glad to hear that you do incorporate it into the language arts curriculum because this is something that most people <coughs> don't think is important. Right. And it is. It is. It, it is. is, it is. Um, <coughs> I taught this course at Choate in the, in the summer programs and it was loaded. I mean, the kids really enjoyed it because it was something new, something different. Um, so the departments really um, had a lot of mixed feelings about this deletion. This is our third year talking about it for the same reason. Um, and they've talked about revisiting it maybe through a, a different revamped course down, you know, shortly down the road. They, they agree with you. It's just it's not running, so. Okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so 
Item V is um, a continuation of the new middle school English language arts units that I presented to you last May. I had two remaining units that had not been published yet. Um, this is one of the two remaining. This is a grade seven uh, reading unit, a uh, nonfiction reading unit focused on essential research skills for teens. Um, just like the units last spring, it comes with a spiral um, unit that the teachers will get in addition to the district document that you have um, in front of you. And I'd be happy to pass it around if anybody wanted to take a look at it. It has the lesson plans in it. So this is a nonfiction reading unit. It was written by the staff developers at the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project at Columbia. The unit focuses on learning in a digital world and then sharing that information with others. Um, students will work in study groups to research topics of contemporary scientific or historical significance that are of interest to them. It focuses on essential study habits, developing effective research practices, internet literacy, checking sources, discerning fake news, and identifying bias in sources. As students gain expertise in a topic, they'll then study disputes and arguments inside the topics um, and come to informed uh, positions on them. The unit, the district um, printed unit, has the common core correlations, the district performance indicator alignment. It has a description of the performance task at the end of the unit. Um, it has um, also, I believe, towards the end, um, a list of the lessons, just sort of an overview of the lessons, um, just sort of a brief overview there. Um, I will say that this particular unit, um, we're also looking at building off of it for some interdisciplinary connections with library and social studies as well, um, because a lot of the skills kind of transcend across the different classes. pleasure of going to college as an adult and um, I was in class with a lot of people I'm hoping just as part of this it's more a comment than a question um, that we are teaching whatever citation is popular in colleges these days like the proper way to source things not just using Microsoft Word to populate your ISBN and and um, have it do it for you only because it for some you know, for factual backup purposes, if you ever go into research or writing, it really is important in, on a college level. And um, it, I, I, it's, it's just, I think that it's a good tie-in for this. I'm sure that it's part of it, but. It, it is part of it, and also in social studies as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Rachi. Well, I'm just getting to the book, so. Um, but it, this is a seven-week unit, and there's 21 lessons. Mm. So when I go through this, there's some of these that they're only going to spend one class on. So exactly like Autumn, to your point, they're going to like just really touch on some of this stuff. So I really hope that the opportunity is there, even looking at like the social studies things here, immigration, free speech, voting rights, segregation, women's rights, civil rights. Um, it, there's a lot of things here that using computer skills and the ability to research these topics can be very powerful interdisciplinary. Absolutely. So, yep. um, and this is an ELA course. Is this, do we have Google certified teachers teaching this? Or, I mean, Teaching this this unit. Yeah, like, do we have like a Google <coughs> person on each one of like the seventh grade teams that can really get the most for this? I mean, to your point, Autumn. I mean, I took an online master's program. All the citations are done, you know, through Google and through the citation yeah. program and everything. And it's mm -hmm. it's a very powerful skill to use, um, and for our students to learn that in middle school is phenomenal because. It's not something that's even taught sometimes at the high school level. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many seventh grade teachers are Google certified. I don't know if we even have that information district wide. Um, we can check, but um, 
No, I, 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 don't, I don't have that information. What type of PD have, will teachers get to teach this? Carrie will work with the ELA teachers um, to make sure that they have good content understanding of the unit as she has done with the other units in this, in this um, new curriculum um, because it is new for everyone. And seven weeks is the recommendation, but as with anything else, it is not <coughs> set in stone. So you have to be guided by your students and what they need. And that's not to say you can spend the year on it either, <laughs> but it, it is, you know, we have always provided uh, recommended pacing, but there's flexibility within that based on the students that are sitting in front of you, because sometimes it moves more quickly and sometimes it moves more slowly. So, you know, they are um, constantly in tune with what the students in front of them need. Because to me, it really feels like a technology class in ELA, which I'm not opposed to. I think it's mm -hmm. fantastic but I think it could be a challenge from some teachers who aren't used to using that level of technology to, again, the disciplines that are in this list of research topics, it's quite extensive. I would mm -hmm. just point out though that it, it does say possible research topics, right. so. Right, they're not gonna do all of that. So oh, my I guess know. is that that will change um, based on the pace of the class. Yeah, they're not gonna get to all of them. There's no way they can. But at the same and they time, may come up with a few ideas of their own as well. So, well, hopefully, they stick close to the curriculum. Maybe, no. maybe well, I think part of this this too. particular unit is these are some recommendations, but it is hearing from the students in terms of the current you events. know topics and current okay. events that they yeah. are interested in to apply their own learning. So it wouldn't be. Um, it wouldn't be um, <coughs> removing yourself from the curriculum. It's in line with the curriculum to say if you have this topic that a group of students comes up with because they are, they are invested and interested and it fits right along with this unit, we want that because we do want students to, to have a, you know, some choice and voice in, mm -hmm. in what they're learning about as long as they stick to the other major themes and topics of that particular unit. It also looks like Ben 3 um, has a lot of public speaking in it. And I know we just eliminated a specific course at the high school, but it looks like they'll be doing a lot of that in seventh grade. <coughs> really, the more you can embed that mm -hmm. throughout a, a student's experience, mm -hmm. elementary, middle, and high, mm -hmm. the more comfortable they become mm -hmm. speaking in public mm -hmm. um, without, you know, raising concerns. Yeah. Mr. Votto, do you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, you know, Carrie, you said something new, but they're really, I mean, research skills has not, that's always been done. Mm -hmm. Have children always been expected to write a research paper in seventh grade? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the big difference is this is digital literacy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's transcending from the print text to the very different practice of researching and reading online. And but do they get that, that help with the digital part of it in a computer class or a tech class? Have they been prepared at all for this mm. between, uh, up until seventh grade in any way, shape, I'm or not 100% sure they what do, the know, computer they do science research you. all the way through. Yeah. Um, and they collaborate a, a lot of the time with the library media specialist. And that goes as far down, um, you know, I can speak to 3-5, right. um, all the way down where they start with the basics and, and they add on year after year. So. You know, they're not going into this blindly. unit blindly. No, they're not. I mean, it is a lot of learn. I mean, there's a lot here. But, you know, as far as the subjects, I do have a question about that. I love the subjects. But the history ones are really, I don't think they relate to the seventh grade curriculum in social studies. Right. They, they are not aligned to the seventh grade social studies curriculum. So these are some possible topics um we wanted to show that there would be a variety of so really building off of student interest so some students are very passionate about the environment i think that tends to be really popular in middle school so we're trying to build off of their enthusiasm about something empathy towards a topic something that they personally relate to to get them really invested in the research well, i would like i mean i'm, I'm assuming that this will be uh, modified um, I know you had to write something in here for now to show right. it to us. To give an, a sample, right. yeah. Um, because they should be, in, in, 
it should be an interdisciplinary uh, assignment. And I, you know, I forgot what the seventh grade curriculum in social studies and it's more geography related. Yeah, it's global studies. Global studies. Yep. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of other topics you could use in here. That's Absolutely. The only question I would ask. So some of those possible topics, the um, provided resources, they come with sample text sets too, so that students will have an exa some examples to look at. Um, so that was, you know, some of those come with that. And to go back to Aaron's point about the public speaking again, um, you know, when I used to have my kids do research, they used to have to do a little bit of a moral report, and that's public speaking. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it is incorporated in that. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully that's part of this too, I don't know. That's a good example of a lot of our performance tasks have an element of public speaking to them, and that's a really good visual example of how we've incorporated that element of the Common Core into our ELA courses, our social studies courses. Ms. Allison. Just a kind of comment to, I mean, a lot of these could be tied into the social studies curriculum, like rights of indigenous people, um, any of the science studies column because it like when we look at like oh, the yeah, industrial revolution well. around the world we look at how that impact uh, created our dependence on fossil fuels and etc so you know as we move forward in, in in an environment where corporations are having to backtrack a lot of the damage that they've done <coughs> we look at global studies as you know why is Europe and Asia why are they so far ahead of us as far as recycling is concerned and, and things like that? So, I mean, it all can be tied together. It's probably just a, um, a loose uh, thing, but I, I, really, I, I really have an appreciation for it because a lot of these things when I was in school, um, which was not that long ago, um, <laughs> was they, we didn't really talk about this until I was in my like junior or senior year mm -hmm. of high school, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Seventh grade ELA. Start take consensus starting with Mr. Votto. Yes. 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 Q. AP Euro. And yeah, and my final item, it's a proposal to modify our current um, high school elective AP European history ECE course. Um, currently offered as a full year course um, in recent years, just like some of our other electives has um, had decreased enrollment due to competing electives across departments. Um, so when we took a look at the curriculum in the current course, because we offer it as an AP and an ECE option, we were easily able to modify the course into two half-year offerings um, with the hope that students would be, who would be interested in some of the content in that course might be able to fit it into their schedule better. Um, so the way the split would work is the um, ECE course is a full year c of content, and so it would be broken into um, one half of the year would be ECE, uh, Western Traditions before 1500, and the second, uh, uh, the second half year course would be the AP ECE Modern Western Traditions. What is the, um, is there any financial implication to the parents for, or the students for the ECE two courses instead of one? Uh, I'm not sure. Is Do it they twice have as to expensive pay? for parents? I'm not you sure. Have to pay for the fall and spring term. Okay. That I wasn't sure. Yeah, that um, I'm not 100% sure. I'm a little concerned about the AP exams because they would only be offered in May. Uh, so if they want the AP portion of it, or that's going to run in the spring, is that correct? <coughs> uh, yes. Is that what we That will run yeah. in the spring. I, I know there are some schools that will run an AP course in the fall on a block <coughs> schedule every day, and right. then the kids have to wait until May to take that test, mm -hmm. and that is not ideal. Mm -hmm. So they'll they'll get ECE in the fall and in the spring and AP ECE in the spring if they take and pass the AP exam. I don't. I, I'm not I don't sure. think we specified when they would be offered. Spring or fall. 
And that is, that is a good consideration. I think that's really important. Good point. So we can talk to both high schools to yeah. ensure that it's a spring offering. For the AP. I'd also like to know about the financial impact. Mm. For the ECE. Right. Mm -hmm. How, how many teachers are you teach this course, or how many courses you're offering? I'm just wondering if you just offer AP <coughs> in the spring, what does that teacher do in the fall? Or are they going to be the same teacher for both courses? It it's the same. Te there's one teacher at each high school who's certified ECE and AP European. Um, okay. So, <coughs> whichever sections of the two would run, they would teach it. Okay. Thank you. So is. I don't know enough about the AP Euro curriculum. <coughs> Does it <coughs> start at 1500? Is that why that would be the second half of Modern Western Traditions? Correct. And Modern Western Traditions, there's a piece that <coughs> goes what? Something up to 1500? So ECE has it split by the time period. So they have, mo they have Western Traditions up to 1450 and then the AP Modern Western Traditions ECE is 1450. Um, on. Any other questions? <coughs> I'm just really concerned about the semesters that they're going to run. Do we want them to do, do we want them to come back a warm? I week? think so. I think yeah. that mm -hmm. would be um, important. Is that I'm just concerned about that. Ms. Mm -hmm. Reggio? And obviously if there's two <coughs> ECE fees, then I'd like to know what the credit transfer is. Okay. Are they transferring in three <laughs> credits, three credits, or is it just a one? Like, are we? I'd like to know both the financial okay. impact and the <laughs> transfer credits. And the transfer credits for the ECE. Right. So okay. what are they earning? What what UConn credits are they earning when they're taking these two? Okay. Because that will also weigh in if parents have to pay twice, but you earn <coughs> twice as many credits. Yeah. Okay, that's mm -hmm. a little bit. Can someone that makes sense. sense. Well, can I okay. suggest that we table this? Yeah. Yes. Second. No. Uh, do we make a motion on that? No, I don't no. think we have. No, no. no. we're going to table it until this to table. Um, how how soon do we need to get this resolved if our course catalog is going to print at the end of January? Oh, this is, we want this for your catalog. Is that what you're saying? <coughs> I mean, quite frankly, yes. I can come back <laughs> next week, yes. Let's with put it on next yeah. week's operations and then um, just with additional information. I will get that for you. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll mm -hmm. just bring the information to the board. Thank you. Um, Carrie will <laughs> research it over the next few days and then go forward from there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so thank you. Thank, thank you. Care. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, moving forward. Our next item of business is, uh, I believe, Ms. Turner? Yes. Correct. Our youth homeless survey. So, um, Wallingford is part of a team. It's called the Youth Engagement Team Initiative. It's a collaboration of um, supports for students ages 16 to 20 and the goal is to really identify and support teens and young adults who are experiencing homelessness um, <coughs> or instability in their home life. One of the things that the state is doing uh, at the end of this month is for both youth and adults, they're doing a, for lack of a better word, census on the streets of individuals experiencing homelessness. So they have asked uh, the public schools, so um, Middletown did it last year, I believe they're going to do it again this year. Uh, Meriden as well has been asked to do it, um, so they asked Wallingford. So what this 
um, is, is a survey that our counselors would be, it's a voluntary survey that the counselors would be going to um, students during CAF waves to see if they're interested in filling out this survey. If they are, great. If they're not, they don't need to. Um, and the goal is to identify any students in our schools that may be experiencing some instability in their home life. So whether that's they are living with relatives, they're living with friends, they're experiencing homelessness, um, or some other, something else that they haven't told an adult that they need support in. So that's the point of this survey. It is anonymous um, and there is an option at the end if they do need support that there are some contacts for them to ask for support in s specific areas. So what we're doing is just showing this to you and asking you if it is okay if we can have our counselors um, provide this survey to our students. Everybody's going to be doing it at the end of this month. What grade level? What grade level? Nine through 12. Are the parents getting any options on this? Well, it's student voluntary. It's all voluntary for the students. What do they do with the results? So basically, it's a statewide survey. So it's being conducted, obviously, statewide, since I said statewide. Um, and really, they're just telling and getting a sense of the needs in Connecticut so we can provide more information to our social agencies so they can build up the supports to provide support. So what we're finding um, is that we're in the Middlesex, Wallingford, Meriden area. Our area of the state is the least supported because we are not identifying individuals that need support. Um, in our area is the shoreline, so Old Saybrook, Old Lyme, and there's not a lot of support at all down there. We're a little bit luckier up here. So the goal is to really identify where the pockets of support are needed and to provide monetary supports <laughs> and services to do that. Servato? Yeah, um, I think this is important. Um, and, I, and parents can elect, no, you're not, you're not saying that. No, saying I'm not children saying Children can. You see, that's, that's the only thing that kind of bothers right. me because we talked about that other middle school <laughs> health <laughs> survey, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we, two of the things we talked about was even actually give the parents a copy of it, don't we? Right. Did you talk mm -hmm. about that? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of the questions on here are similar. Not, you know, not yeah, they're not, there not are the some that are like, eh, eh but yeah. nothing that a high school hasn't seen. I'm wondering if we need to have parents look at this first. I don't know. What do you all think? And I don't know if that's something that I have the permission to do. Okay. Does that make sense? Because yeah. it's not our survey, it's the state giving the survey. It's just a lot of very, I mean, like, have you been told you have HIV? I mean, to be able to put some of these <coughs> medical things in here, yeah. I think are. Well, have you ever done. served in the armed forces? Or are you, are you asking high school students? Right, because this Prison? is for 16 to 20 year olds. Oh. But yeah. we're asking. The intent our is high very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd say the intent's awesome. Yeah. <coughs> I just don't know if you're going to get. And this is voluntary, so if the board is not comfortable with us doing it in our schools, we don't need to. How, how sure are we that we would be monetarily supported somehow in what way? Because that, isn't that what you said? Well, we specifically wouldn't, but it's more to build up the services for the students. So every month I meet with this team and we're looking at what are some ways that we can provide housing, <coughs> um, food, access to jobs, transportation, and this just gives us a better idea of what towns and what areas need those supports. So the benefit to Wallingford to doing this is if we do have a section of students, and I can say to you that one of the things that Dr. Menzo said when I came in here is we are not identifying <coughs> our high schoolers that are homeless. That's right. Because a kid that's living on a friend's couch is homeless. Right. Mm -hmm. But our high schoolers aren't telling us that. So the benefit of this would be maybe we can catch a couple of kids that we haven't been able to catch yet, or at least bring the awareness of <coughs> if you don't have a stable home, there are ways for you to ask for support. But is the state going to help us in any way so the deal state, with this? Well, the, the results of this? I mean, we don't know that. Not directly. I thought you kind of made it sound <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I didn't make it sound prettier than it really was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah probably. 
Because you have um, kind of have statistics. Here yeah. That we so they're going to look at the statistics. They're going to look at the awareness. And what, can I say that that'll send some money down to us? Maybe. I can't promise. You know, but at least they'll know that Wallingford's needier than what they thought it was before. Right. <laughs> that would be the ultimate benefit. To be honest with you. I almost look at it as a tool that could be used by a counselor or a social worker or somebody when you have a kid in need. I, I, I'm just thinking, and, and I can say this straight, I, I was from a, a household that would have been considered at risk right now, and I know I wouldn't have answered some of these questions because I wouldn't have wanted to, some, something happened to my parent, my mother, you know, even though she wasn't fulfilling some of that. Right, so, so I, I think don't know the thought, general no, course. Absolutely. That so I think the thought was so when they did this last year in Middletown, <coughs> is what they saw was because you'll see if they don't if they say they don't want to participate, then they don't do the next question. Or if they don't feel comfortable answering a question, it says not applicable. But what they saw was friends of kids would come up to the counselors afterwards and say, you know, I heard that question. You may you may want to go talk to him or her. Or you know, it kind of brought up that piece because the, for a high schooler, their friend knows more than the parent does, really. Right. Um, so that would be the only thing. Ms. Allenson and then Ms. Uh That was my actual exact comment that I, you know, we had, a, we've all ex experienced some youth that has been in a situation, right? And m most often, um, we would find out from the kid that he was living with that right. um, so it I mean it may behoove the survey gatherers um, <coughs> to say have do, do you have a friend living on your couch you know or or in a situation because um, or do you have somebody temporarily staying in your household <coughs> only because a lo most people aren't going to self-identify but um, you know that right. that may be a way to identify those opportunities, but if they're coming forward anyways, you know, um, yeah. it's. Um, with regard to privacy issues, because that always concerns me. Yes. <clears throat> and having someone overhear the conversation. So, actually, very good point. So what they're given is they're given a tablet. And they read the questions and answer it, so nobody knows what they're answering. Okay. Except, and not even the counselor does unless they tell them. It goes right into the system, so it's like a, and that's why I said it's anonymous. It just goes into the survey system, and gets tabulated by um, region. Okay, because that was a concern when I when I heard the counselor was going right. to meet them in the cafeteria, and then not in an intentional way, but somebody perhaps could overhear, overhear what they're speaking about. That was a right. concern of mine. But if it's anonymous, how do we know who to help? Because the point is know. the kids know that they're answering these questions, and then at the end there's a little thing that says, if you, it says, um, because you answered yes, we want to know, help you. we want you to know that help is available, <coughs> and they give them resources to connect or they speak to them. So it, it's, it's still in their hands mm -hmm. where they can seek support or not. <coughs> When did, or where did you say this was going to be administered? It's the cafeteria? end of this month. Uh, the whole state does it on the same day. So, yeah. Um, so I, it's taking out of academic time during, and offered to everybody? During lunch. Okay. So they'll set up like a little table over to the side. They'll let them know. They have like little um, like prizes or like little gimmies on the table that the kids complete the survey. They get like a little... I said I think they did um, gift cards last okay. year or little like bouncy balls and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so it's totally if the kid walks over to the table, great, they take it. If they don't walk over to the table, they don't take okay. it. Okay, I'm okay with that, Ms. Raggio. So when you say the counselors are these state employees, they're not. We're not taking our <coughs> guidance counselors out of guidance to do this. It's our counselors. Ooh. Yes. Yep. They're just buried this time of year with college stuff coming back in and yeah. scheduling and. and um, Do they have enough time? Sorry. That's okay. Yes. So the data. So how long have they been doing this? In um, I know this is at least the third year. Okay. But I'm just saying. Do you know if there's data that's been telling them anything specific on, or, are, are kids answering honestly? Are they? So I can tell you stuff? the data has told them specifically in our area how many kids are in need and which parts of our 
region they're not getting. So that's how they know that they haven't been reaching Wallingford and they haven't been reaching the shoreline. Okay. Yeah. But we have not administered this survey. I know Middletown's doing it again this year. I do not know about Meriden. I haven't, our meeting's actually this Monday coming up, so I don't know. Um, are we planning on announcing to <coughs> parents that this may be happening at lunch? Your child can, do parents have any knowledge of this? I can foresee some pushback. We I, can. My too. child came home right. and took a survey at school and nobody told me it was mm -hmm. available or nobody told me that they were gonna be able to I do it. A, we have a policy on survey administration. We do. Yeah. And what's the, pol I mean, I'm the policy up right now? So I don't, if it's in our policy that we provide them information with that, I don't see why we couldn't. During lunchtime, is it private enough? It's not a long survey at all. Oh. It's very short. A lot of these are, yeah. Okay. It no, looks a lot longer because there's a lot of choices, but it's only like 10 questions, right? Are, are they giving us the tablets to use or are we having to pop? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, we do, we have our risky survey. You almost can take a couple of these questions and add it. I mean, some of them are the same. And if you really wanted to know something, <coughs> maybe add it to it. I just. True. I keep thinking middle school, I shouldn't. Huh? Right. Yeah, no. I keep thinking middle school instead of high school. But you're right, a lot of these are in that. Not a lot, but some but that's what I'm wondering if we're duplicating. <coughs> We just do want to just add a couple things about how about housing. Well, the only difference is this: we have no we affiliation to this at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have no affiliation to this. This is their survey that they've asked us to administer. Right. Right. So but we won't get any of the data. Right, but we do know. for the risky for the risky survey. We do get all the data. Right, but I can't give them. I can't give the state that data for this. Mr. Ross. Yeah, I still. This one question here bothers me. It's been in another survey. Uh, how do you describe your ethnicity from the following options? Uh, and I, that's ethnicity. in the back page. Right. So all we're asking, either they're Hispanic or they're not. That's all they're asking. Correct. So there's only two, two choices of ethnicity? Correct. Why would we single out Hispanic? To, you know, I don't because the race is above. So they, they look at race and then they look at ethnicity. It's just how the federal government it has been asking ethnicity and race questions. So that's uniform across all surveys and all information that schools and employers gather. Because you, beca you can be, you know, your race and your and whether you're Hispanic or not really aren't related, so I guess that's why they carry it out there. Did you find it, Mrs. Latour? I did. So we do have a policy IGDM. It's a little on the old side, but it does speak to um, having parent consent to take part in a survey analysis or evaluation that reveals information concerning um, political mm -hmm. affiliation, mental or psychological problems of the student or the student's family, sex mm -hmm. behavior or attitudes, um, illegal, antisocial, self-incriminating and demeaning behavior and so on. So I'll forward the policy for you so you will need to get parental consent for it. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. I'd say you play it safe. I, I mean, personally, there's several questions here I'm not very excited about, and I think if we really want to look at homelessness, I think we could add that to it, and we can, and we do share our data with the state, so we could get something back, but I'm just, I'm concerned about the AIDS one, I'm concerned about, I mean, some of this is for, seems like older kids, have you served in the armed forces, that doesn't even, you know, oh, yeah, have you been in prison or jail, I mean, mm -hmm. the sexual acts ones we already, t we already cover, I, and then when I even look at gender identity, gender, um, sexual orientation, I don't even know if our freshman kids will know pansexual and you know what I mean, some of these other terms and You'd stuff. You'd be surprised. Okay. They do. But 
you know, and then you're talking about institutional. So it just seems like yeah. it's a little older. I think this third page is really the important one, right? Yes. Yes. Because that's what we really, we really want to know if kids are homeless. And right, and I, I'm wondering if we could just add that to our risk of behavior somehow. I can. You're right, that's an area we really don't. We, we don't, don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't know. No, I we agree. Don't know. We could do better on that area. We, we just passed the policy on, on something with homeless. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we have to provide them and all that. So it really would go well with this, that part. Also, if we're looking for 16 to 20 year olds, that's typically not a freshman. No, right. Or a sophomore not. at this point. Mm. Some yeah. sophomores. Sophomores, you'll have at 16. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we can take consensus and vote whether or not we want the survey to happen at all. And if we vote no, then <coughs> we shut it down right now. Uh, if we if we take consensus and we're comfortable with it, then we're going to have to figure out how par parental permission would get, how we do it through for parental permission. And address your last point mm -hmm. that it shouldn't be given to freshmen. No, right. should it, you got to be mm -hmm. sixteen to take it. So what's this other survey that we're talking about that are, that's administered already? Can't, mm -mm. Can, if we vote no, can we, we also add that to, mm -hmm. add a homelessness so study the to the that? The behavior behavior survey we the that was already given. I think we're limited to what we can add to it on. Oh, okay. Because it's. That's a federal state. State. Yeah. Right, that one is from right. the state, and oh, you are okay. limited in. in but we've what added to it. Some we've added some questions yeah, that are specific to Olympic that we asked to have. That's no, not totally not exactly one. the state. No, this, not this one. This one you can't. I understand right. that. Right. But right. I'm just I'm just saying if the big thing is the the home you know mm. the homeless mm -hmm. issue, I think we can add that to the other one yeah, because I do think that. it's something we need to know. I just don't know that That's this is my, the right tool. My concern is asking children to self-identify in a lot of those ways while some of them may know, some of them still be still may be in that space where they don't know yet and um, it I I don't I don't feel comfortable um, I understand how surveys work and why we want uh, ethnicity and, and race data and, and sexual orientation because there may be a tie-in to all of those factors. But on the basis, this is being presented as we want to know if we have homeless right. children in our district, not if we have homeless white children, et cetera, et cetera. Like, so <laughs> if we run it from the basis, uh, from, the, from the view of homelessness, then let's put it somewhere else because this is an awful long survey with a lot of identification that I don't necessarily know that I personally feel comfortable having kids fill out um, just my two cents, I guess. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I know we, we tweaked the other one, mm -hmm. but I, I thought there were some parameters, though. You don't what? I said I, I thought so. There was. There, was, there were. There was yeah, there were definitely. There's only a number you yeah. can put in. Is it yeah. a number, yeah. like a number or is it like five questions or something yeah. like that? Yeah, there was yeah. like. There's only so many ads that we could have. Like four or five questions, right. something like that. Topic wise or number wise? Number wise. I number thought it was number, number wise. wise. But I think. I All mean, right, then that's. But, but could we get this information with. Doing it so what I can do, self. if you still want us to gather the other information, is I can work with Tony Loomis, and he and I can come up with a way that we can do that in, in a non-threatening manner. Okay? Yeah. I like that better. That we can I, gather I the homeless information yes. on Without the, having all of the other self-identification yes. and... Yes. Have we ever asked our counselors if they know of any homeless... Yeah. Our counselors... I suspect that they do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, would suspect I suspect so. that we know any student who is homeless or on the verge of homelessness. Yeah. But some kids don't uh, will not identify themselves as homeless if they're living at their aunt's house. No, mm -hmm. I'm living at my aunt's. I'm not homeless. Right. right. So, so our counselors are getting much better at that, and they understand. It's more of getting the kids to come out and talk to them about it. Right. Yeah. Why don't we take consensus on the survey as is? Are we okay with that? We'll start with Mr. Votto. No. 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 Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> it's not my survey. <laughs> <laughs> I will let them know. Okay. okay. We, Thank yeah. you. The um, minutes reflect that we, when we do come up with the other survey, 
that we think of adding something about homelessness on that. Right. I mean, I yeah, don't even for mind. the high school one. Yeah. 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 I don't the even mind school. the counselors using this as a tool to if they're counseling and working with someone that they think is homeless, but I think that that's more of you know a tool for them. Mm -hmm. Amy, what department was this? <coughs> you said it was from the state. What? What? So it is um, not a specific department. It's a collaboration of probation, of um, youth and family services, and there's a there's a whole there's like six different agencies, but it's basically um, mental health, probation, DCF. Um, employment and transportation, all social agencies. So there were no particular grants tied to any of this or anything, it was, no, okay. Nope. Okay. Thank you. Okay, last part of our agenda is po policy and discussion. I think we said A through F, we're gonna go so together. So actually what I would like to do is kind of look at A through F and then I and J, cause they kind of all go together. Okay. So if you can follow along with me for a minute. Bill. We're proposing the deletion, this is I and J that I'm speaking to, of policy 0521 and regulation 0521, which is non-discrimination, because it's under the wrong section. So we're just wiping, it's old, we're wiping it out <coughs> completely, um, which is why you see it up for deletion. Do you wanna take consensus on that, or do you wanna hear the whole spiel? Let's take consensus on that. On I and J. I promise I that there is a, a replacement for it. Uh, uh, <laughs> no place. I guess why, why are they in the wrong place? I, I, to be honest, I don't know. Okay. The they're, are they're old, if you know, you know, they are old. They're just in the wrong section. They don't belong under mission goals and objectives. They belong under community board operation. And this was according to our attorneys. So we're gonna take their advice and put it in the right section. And as I said, there is a replacement, so no one has to worry, we'll be without. Let's take consensus, starting with Mr. Votto. Yes. 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 Okay. So as I promised you, there is a replacement for that in um, A and B. If you look at A and B, it's the first read of the policy and regulation 1010 and 1010A, non-discrimination, and it goes under the community board operations. You'll notice in both A and B that there are no shading, there is no shading, there are no strikeouts. This is a <coughs> brand new policy. The policy is recommended by our attorney Shipman Goodwin, and it is the non-discrimination policy for the Board of Education so that in the hiring process or otherwise that we do not discriminate on the basis of anything, race, religion, color, national origin, alienage, sex, sexual orientation, et cetera. So it's a pretty standard policy. Um, it gives whomever is looking at this policy all of the addresses and commissions for filing a complaint we purposely left out specific names under our assistant superintendent for personnel who is the Title <coughs> IX coordinator. Um, so that, not that we're saying this will happen, <laughs> if that ever changes, the same for the director of special education that we don't have to constantly go back for um, you know, change, changes of names. And we, we started that practice um, a couple of special ed directors ago, Yeah. so. <laughs> So the, this is the first read. I mean, this is straight from our attorneys in terms of all of the language that we used in this policy, A and B. And another reason why we did them all together too was for consistency purposes. So we have a non-discrimination policy at the board level. Then we also have non-discrimination at the personnel level, so our teaching staff, um, et cetera, and then at the student level. So everything matches um, in terms of policy and regulation if there is a complaint or um, a process by which someone feels that they've been discriminated upon. So if you look at C and D, this is the personnel version of non-discrimination. <clears throat> 
in C, which is the policy, we, you'll see the strikeouts where we took out things, and again, I'm not exactly sure why because it was uh, a little bit before my time. There was information in the personnel <coughs> policy about students. So we just tried to clean up a lot of language and keep it very specific to employees or applicants in terms of not discriminating against anyone looking to be hired, promoted, compensated, job assignments, et cetera. Okay. <coughs> and then D, which is the regulation, just speaks to the process by which if someone had a complaint, how they would go about filing that complaint. And then 4E and 4F is the student version. So first is the policy where you'll see in the shaded area what we've added. Again, on the advice of our attorneys. And then the regulation is the same. So basically, through state statute, um, it is recommended that alienage is put in to the non-discrimination policies, which is um, speaking to someone's immigration status and not discriminating uh, upon anyone based on that. And then everything else, which has always been in our policy, race, <coughs> color, religion, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. That was our You've first had these start. all since December, so mm -hmm. if there are any concerns with the language, the strikeouts, or the shades, um, we would need to kind of think about that this, this evening so that it could be reflected for the second read, which would be next month. Any questions or concerns? No. Nope. Okay, nope. so let's mm -hmm. talk about G. Do you want to? Do you want to take consensus on all eight? I thought we didn't take consensus on a first read. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, we don't. Uh, you know, you're right, you don't, but I just need to know, I guess, does anybody have any problem with yeah. the language? Problems with tonight. language for tonight. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. See, that, that was the way I was going to suggest consensus to make sure that that's definitely the case, that nobody has a concern with making any changes. So yeah. if you just want to say it the way you did, does anybody mm -hmm. have any changes? Everybody says no, mm -hmm. that's fine. But yeah, you're good. But looking at it, just, it you it could come up with a change next month. So the value of consensus is kind of useless if we're going right. you know, for a second it, read. Correct. But I, I you know, Dr. Menzo and I have talked about this quite a bit in terms of policy that at the second read point, um, if there are changes to language so that it then for the <coughs> third it can go on consent that month that you would really want to Clean it up agree to your changes that evening. Do you know what I mean? Just so everyone can see final form what it actually looks like right. instead of read. am I making sense? Yeah, you want you want the changes between now and then so that in case we want to discuss the changes at the second read. Correct. Okay. Okay. So we have until we, we not, might not necessarily have to do them on a first read tonight, but get right. them to you before the mm -hmm. second read. Right. Okay, let's get them. Any concerns, get them to uh, Mrs. Latour before the second read, please. Okay, okay, so now we can talk about G, regulation for electronic devices. Right. So this has been, this is, this is the second read of this regulation. Um, you see strikeouts and strike, uh, shaded versions and strikeouts to reflect changes um, based on the last time we talked about this. <coughs> and so, uh, you know, you, you would have to discuss tonight whether or not you'll accept the, the changes that were discussed from the last time we discussed this, poli uh, this regulation to now. <coughs> Ms. Purcell and then Ms. Levesque. All right, first I want to say I'm very excited about the changes, but I also want to let you know that we didn't, some of the stuff I didn't discuss because again, I thought about it after we left. Yeah. And so I sent it to the policy committee, just some of the ideas, because I was concerned about, I remember Aaron and I think it might've been Tammy too, I can't remember who else brought it up, but they were concerned about the teacher, so much stress on the teacher if they mm -hmm. have to call home right away. 
And I just felt like some students may not even think about it. And then, you know, if you just tell them, they're like, oh, okay. And I also thought from the parent point of view was that if you're calling me the first time and you <coughs> told my kid to put it away and they did, why are you calling me? <coughs> kind of thing. So I kind of felt like, you know, this will catch the habitual people that do it, but it, it doesn't like come down so fast, so hard, and so much on the teacher right away. Right, so, so if you look, most of the changes are in the section two where it's on the second page under consequences where you look at the first offense and it's just the student receives a verbal warning regarding the violation of the policy itself. Second offense would be the electronic device is taken, um, so it's a word wordsmithing. Um, but parents are notified by school admin, which was important uh, based on the discussion from last time. Um, and the student can collect the device from the main office at the end of the instructional day. And then the third offense is that the electronic device is taken and delivered to the main office until a parent comes to the school and uh, the electronic is, device is returned to the parent. Um, this provides a level of consistency for the schools and um, also provides the building with um, what they need to do in cases of repeated misuse. And we I didn't want to get too nitty gritty and in the weeds with, right. you know, exactly, you know, when the parent is called or who called, you know, it, it's a school administration. <coughs> so whether that's AP mm -hmm. or the principal themselves, elementary, um, absolutely would do that. At the high school, you know, it could be any one of the admin. It right. really, we, we did want to provide some flexibility to the buildings to do as they see fit with kind of a tight, outer structure and then the ability to function within that structure on their own. Right. And it also seemed to follow up similar offenses, you know, like the consequences were, right, from were their similar to, right. to other offenses that were similar Correct. to that versus. I think actually, Mrs. Purcell, when you sent me some of your comments, it was more aligned with how they deal with dress code violations. Right. Um, so. Ms. Lovett? So on the second <coughs> offense and yep. the third offense, yep. so the electronic device is taken. Mm -hmm. Now, who can take it? The para, if there's a paraeducator, if there's the teacher? That's going to be first very... Because mm. I just want to make sure that we know who is... Yeah, I know. But, I mean... During lunch, or you know, not lunch people. I've asked that. I just speaks to an clear. administrator, teacher, or paraeducator. I, it says or coach as well, but you know. I just want to make sure that we don't just have because I, I mean some of these devices are expensive, of and we want to make sure that whoever's confiscating it um, to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm treats it with care and make sure that it gets down to the office. That's yep. all I'm saying. Absolutely. Any other questions? Um, <coughs> so we're not really taking consensus on the second read either. No, so this will go on consent go at the end consent. of the month. This is the way, this policy, the way it's read tonight is the way it's going to go regulation. on. It's a regulation. It's a regulation. It's a regulation. regulation. Sorry, so what did Sorry. I say, policy? Yeah. This regulation and the way it's written tonight will go on consent agenda for our full board meeting at the end of the month. Are there any concerns? Mr. Ross. Yeah, I am. Um, still instructional school day. Uh, and I've noticed, and I'm sure some of us, other people have noticed, that all of a sudden we have a, a lot of students wearing these little white things in their ears all day. And uh, obviously they're on their cell phone all day. And, uh, I don't see that mentioned. I see it says keeping the off position, which... This policy uh, doesn't get into AirPods. Yeah. Or I know earbuds. That. Yeah, I know. The, the, but regula the, this regulation doesn't. But I the understand doesn't that. Either. But using the air pads or ear pads or whatever you want to call them means that their cell phone is on. 
it they don't may work. or it may not, to be quite frank. You know, my uh, I'll speak to my own personal experience on this because I have an eighth grader who just received a set over the holidays and he's got one hanging out of his ear and I'll say, what is that doing there? And he's like, yeah. oh, I just left it in there. And his phone is off. But, you know, that is, that is, um, they, you know, we don't have a policy or regulation that says they can't have an AirPod, hang, AirPod hanging out of their ear. It does not not necessarily mean that their phone is on. It just means that that's where they're carrying their AirPod. <laughs> you know, I, I, it could be. It absolutely could be. Could be. To, their Chromebooks to their Chromebook or to their iPad for an instructional. You know, we do ask, in some cases, there are teachers who ask students to have a headphone, an earbud, or an AirPod to do work. So, Mr. Ross, that could very well be too to serve that purpose through their Chromebook or through an iPad that they're using at school. I mean, some of these things we're just not going to know. Well, that's uh, it's. I understand it's it's a regulation, but when I how how do we know if the kids got the, the cell phone on? We can't on, force on, it. I, I, you're not. I mean, our policy states that the cell phone should be not visible during the instructional school day outside of lunch at the high school. And, you know, at some point, if the student has the little ear, air pod hanging out of his ear, but they're attending and engaged and doing everything that they're supposed to be doing, I mean, we're not going to know whether that yeah. is hooked into his cell phone or not, but he, the student, he or she is still learning. Um, I don't think we're ever going to be able to mm -hmm. to put everything in a regulation or a policy. It's really going to come down to engagement Teacher. of the student and are they learning and focused and attentive to what it is that they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and we're never going to be able to keep up with every piece of, of technology that comes out that could be uh, wirelessly linked to a cell phone. Uh, tomorrow something new could sure. come right yeah. out, and I'm, we're not going to know that. But you do, you do have it in there. You have um, cellular telephones and other wireless communication devices. So that kind of I mean, that could that be, either. yeah. It could be. Mr. Rado? Thank you, Mr. Again, Rado. I think it's just, it's got to be the enforcement on the right. part of the teacher. Right. You know, some teachers are more tolerant than others with certain things. I mean, if I was teaching and a kid had one of those things in his ear, I'd tell him to take it out. Um, same with gum chewing. You know. Some teachers are more tolerant with that than others. They see somebody chewing gum, they don't say anything. Other teachers will scream and yell. It's, I think it's, it's going to depend. Is it a disruption to the student? Is it a disruption to others? So like <clears> take <throat> the gum chewing. A student can be gum chewing quietly, doing their work, right. and it's not, not an issue. Someone could be blowing bubbles and snapping and their gum and disrupting the entire class. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know. As an aside, I was in church on Christmas Eve. And there was a kid sitting in front of me with one of those things in his ear. And the priest walked by and said to the kid, take that out of your ear. <laughs> and the kid took it out. And as soon as the priest went to the back, he put it back in his ear. It's kind of funny. But anyhow, I don't know if it was on or not. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so how we see it is how it'll go for next time. Um, I think we have one more. We do. We're in the home stretch, folks. Yeah. So this is H. This is the second read as well after multiple revisions. Really what this does is just formalize everything that you've already taken consensus on as a board. So this is the policy with the new graduation requirements for our current freshman class that speaks to just how many credits do they need for graduation? So you'll see that all in the shaded part. <coughs> the humanities bucket that you all came to consensus on, the STEM bucket, et cetera. It speaks to um, the requirements for promotion for, to, for grade 10, 11, and 12 status and it speaks to the world language credit earned in the middle school moving forward and the algebra credit um, moving forward as well for high school credit. The one change you'll see in there, and this was at the request of the math management team, 
was that the grade of algebra at the middle school level was a 70 or better mm -hmm. in order for them to receive that, that credit towards graduation. They felt that Algebra One is such an um, important foundational class from subsequent math experiences that if the student did not receive a 70, that, that more than likely, and it has happened in the past, the child is recommended to take the class over again. Yeah. And usually that is done through guidance, um, through a meeting with parents, um, through a thorough explanation of why, even though it's a passing grade, um, and it has happened on, on some occasions. Ms. Levesque. Um, on page, whatever, three. Uh-huh. <clears throat> There's just a typo, and since we're on the second read, I thought I'd correct it right oh, now. Oh, please, thank you. Um, so we're in the community service hours, so yep. if you look at one, two, three, four, the fifth line down, uh -huh. it should be approved by an administrator instead yep. of and. And the other question is, are we adhering to that standard of making sure that um, the forms are being filled out? Yes, there's always continued work in that area, to be honest. Uh, there's been a lot of um, um, discussion. Thank you. Discussion about making certain through guidance um, and through main office that that is occurring. Um, I, I can't, you know, say enough how much, um, you know, building admin and Tony Loomis have been working with the two guidance departments to kind of make sure that there are structures in place and protocols in place to do some of the things that we need to do at, at what are very, very busy times. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. We are. Okay, As, I just want to make yeah. sure because some sometimes some of the some of the students that come in with things that they feel are community based yep. um, service hours uh, um, are are very loosely identifying that mm -hmm. um, criteria. So you know this too. I know normally it is it is preferable to do policy and regulation at the same time. Um, this has been something that's been lingering for quite some time, the mm -hmm. policy, right. which is really why it's important to get this on consent and move this forward. Right. And now the regulation is in works so that when we're looking at those um, other opportunities to gain credit <coughs> through apprenticeship mm -hmm. and internship and, and all of those things, those will be um, very specifically detailed in the regulation piece. Mm -hmm. um, will, I've been concerned uh, that students that are doing community service hours and are signed off on community service hours, again, aren't necessarily community service. It exactly. It's a nonprofit and I've seen <coughs> I've seen kids in the community that maybe work for a, um, a camp or something where the owner is making a big profit and they're working for free under the pretense of community service. Mm -hmm. So the regulation will address what exactly community service is? Is that what we're saying? No, no. actually I wasn't going to be saying that. I mean, <laughs> can we make that regulation address what exactly community service is? That would be at the will of the policy committee and it's as long as it aligns it's with <laughs> you know, state statute, you have to, you have to remember, as a Board of Education, you have the right to be more stringent than mm -hmm. the state, mm -hmm. you know, um, statute. Um, but we just have to make sure that we're in line with that first. And so if you as a, as a Board of Education want to put more specific criteria in for community service, <coughs> that is your ability to do, as long as you take consensus and it, it moves forward that way. And okay. doing it with enough notice so that, you know, people, we're not people can prepare. By, we're not getting into it into the course, the program of studies by the end of January. <laughs> I, I think that's always going to be difficult to monitor, though. Yeah, but it if really you is. require from a nonprofit and ask for their nonprofit tax ID number or something, yeah, then. Yeah, for that, yeah. yeah. But sometimes it's like they, they're doing a club with <coughs> Yeah, you're right. It's a school. It's but a didn't school you say activity. in your comment that, that the, the, <coughs> the child was working for free? Is that what you said? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So if yes. they're, if they're not getting paid, issue. 
but the own, but maybe the so person the, that they're working for is making a killing. Making right, a but if the child is just putting in time and helping, doing something and not getting mm -hmm. paid, that can't be considered community service. I, I guess it could. I don't know. I, I'm not. I don't know. I, I would. I would, I would assume I was, that. If I was a 16-year-old doing that, I'd want to get paid. Yeah, me too. But if the kid is doing it and not getting paid, should we reward yeah. that person with community hours? See, that's what I mean. It gets to be a real right. sticky thing. For, for me personally, as a child that just graduated last year, a lot of what she did was with hands. Right. She did not get paid for it. Right. Um, her baby was born. Right. Um, but that, I mean, they didn't throw other clubs and other things that they did, not for profit, going through the town, not getting paid for it, didn't have a tax ID. But, you know, so again, it varies. Like if the child just decided to rate leaves for somebody, how, how do we, mm. how do we <clears throat> keep track of things like Well, that? that's just yeah. it. Yeah, the, does the person they rate leaves for and write a letter or something? They or sign a, a form sign and that goes form. to guidance and the student's supposed to put a, a note in there as to what they got out of the experience. It's supposed to be approved prior to the community right. service and then turned back in with the signature after the service happens. <clears throat> so could it, couldn't something like that be approved prior to the community? So, I mean, I know I that we're, we're not. A little, we kind of took a left turn a little bit. Mm -hmm. so. You're right, you're right. <laughs> I, can I get <laughs> back turn to back. Blame Aaron for that. Sorry. <laughs> can I go back to it, Mrs. Uh, Corso? Can I make yes. a comment on the regulation? Yes. Um, it's a policy. Policy, policy. sorry. Um, I think the last time we saw this was in September. I think so. That I'm actually, actually online trying read. to look at yeah. the last time. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually a third. Well, um, it is a multiple iteration of a second read. Okay, I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> just for transparency yep. sake, uh, there are three paragraphs that have been removed from the September version to today's, and that was based on my comments in September, but just so all the board members understand, the paragraphs that started with, and they spoke about high school graduation credit, Right. then there's, but we don't, so I had to go back to September to see that version and compare it to today's and say, oh yeah, these are the paragraphs. That mm. There's nothing, In there's no red line, there's no trace, <clears throat> like, I, I just, yeah. I'm an auditor, yeah, no, I Yeah, no, I don't trail. disagree with you on that one at all. So what we can do moving forward, if you'd like, from first read, whatever changes are, even, follow me on this one, because it's getting late and I'm getting a little loopy. You know, we everything we add, we shade, right? And everything we take out, we strike out. Right. So in the first read, if we've added language, for example, September's version, yes. where we added language, so you see all the shade. Mm -hmm. But then, I wasn't at the September meeting, a lot of things were taken out. The sh For second read purposes, what we can do is keep the shade, but then strike the shade out. That so at least you can start to right. see a it little bit of the transition right. through. Um, and that might help keep things at least clean. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, then no, we don't have to, I don't have to compare two right. versions. I don't disagree. And go back to the YouTube to say what was said. Yes. Right. These two poli the two the not two policies, the one regulation and the one policy that were on multiple reads. Right. That is kind of like what we need to try to start to maybe not do. Mm -hmm. Um, so at the time of the meeting where we're disagreeing, say, on language, if we come up with the new language and take consensus that night, then come second read, everybody is very well versed on, mm -hmm. yes, we all agreed we didn't like these three paragraphs, so we struck them out. And that is typically how, you know, you would go from first read to second read, and then everyone kind of sees final version, you know, second read version, and then, oh, I really, I don't like that word either. You talk about it, you agree, we like this word better. You all know then, once it goes on consent at the end of the month, <coughs> that it is what we said it was gonna be at that instructional meeting. Does and that I'm make sense? And I'm fine with that, that's a change in practice, because we've been told, this is just the first read, you got another shot at this, yeah. it's not. Oh, you will always have another shot. By second read, that's at the point in time where. That's final call. Yeah, because, and if you can agree at, at that night that, yeah, we like that language or we don't, and this is the language we do like, because then if I go back, if we just say, this is your second read, send me your thoughts, and then we change it, and then it goes on consent, 
and there is no more opportunity. Well, well wait a minute now. Karen, you help me with this one because you're, you're an old, my old person like me. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, thank you so much. Uh, 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 if that's true, mm -hmm. can't we, can't somebody ask to remove that from the consent yeah, agenda? Yeah, we did that for yes, uh, it can, to, still it can to still change it, to still change it. Yes, it can happen. You can ask that it be removed from consent. Right, but but hopefully we don't, hopefully that doesn't happen. Right. Point, right. You would hope you wouldn't have to. And for something like this, it starts, I, I'm going to speak for myself here. Uh, it starts to get very confusing for me when we're yes. on like the fourth or fifth version of yes. something, but it's still the second. It, it just gets no, really I hard to follow. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, have. yeah, I can do that. I can strike out the shades if we don't like the shade, you know, that type of thing, just to kind of keep everybody on the same page. Okay. And I, I think for clarity's sake, this was a particularly busy policy this is a good one policy. <clears throat> so it was a very you know there were a lot of parts to it and so we had to go over a lot of things right and, and, so. and more than likely you'll see this come up again oh good and again because as things start to become more clear with internships and and other opportunities right. for kids some of that will stay in regulation but some of it will have to also be embedded in policy mm -hmm. but at the very least having the one formal policy that's adopted right. with all of the new buckets right. even we'll at help. this little shell we need to get that done right. and and get that <clears throat> formalized um, we can always add to it i just i have a specific question about the algebra piece yep <coughs> if a student gets a 75 in algebra, earns one credit, decides to repeat algebra in high school, does he earn another credit for algebra in high school? So if a student hmm. they earn takes a credit it, in eighth grade, but they're, they, they're like, nope, I didn't learn I enough. I don't believe you can get credit for the same class. No. But can you take it again? You can take it again, but you're not going to be carrying in the middle school credit. So if you repeat it, you choose to forego that middle school credit. Because I am 99% positive and I will check on just in do case. Do you want to put that in there? I do believe that is in the program of studies that you okay. cannot get two okay. credit. You know, you, if okay. you repeat a class, you, you don't double dip. Okay. And there are things that you're not going to have every single thing in the policy. Mm -hmm. This is the, the big buckets mm -hmm. and it's important. Um, and then there are some things that are memorialized in the curriculum planning guide and correct but I will check on that for you Thank Aaron you. just to make sure that I'm right correct me if I'm wrong if you get a 70 or C all right for the sake of, of discussion and you take it again and if you get an A if you take it in high school and get the higher grade that will count towards your GPA the 70 or the C that's coming in from middle school does not count towards right. your GPA. correct right that is correct right okay any other questions or concerns? Public comment. Raj, please introduce yourself. Raj and Deering of Sharon Drive. Just want to give some thoughts on two things that I heard discussed tonight. First, in regards to the additional level for Spanish 3. First of all, I think this is a wonderful idea. I could see this being of great benefit to many students. I would encourage the school district to explore options to expand this option to other languages. And I would wonder, with some creative planning, if there could be a way to have students from multiple levels in the same classroom, especially with all the technology available with flipped classrooms and whatnot, to be able to give additional assignments to students that are interested in taking a more rigorous level. And also in regards to the electronic device policy, I could see there being some strong benefit in not having a lot of action required on the part of the teacher for a first offense, as I know that our teachers are quite busy and overloaded as is. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.